Every day, you essentially pay your dues by doing the harder thing when it's the right thing to do. Pat, my friend, how are you? I'm doing great, mate. How are you? I appreciate uh, both of our efforts on coordinating a time that actually works yeah. for this as you're across you the pond me, very, very far. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. What time is I it? I just realized you? as soon as we went live, I've gone more Aussie. How you doing, mate? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I think I did the same with really me. <laughs> <laughs> dude whenever we have british british or aussie guests on people are always for some reason like way more fa- it's just like classic american like problem right but like like oh man it was so fun to listen to that podcast because their accent is so cool and it keeps me engaged <laughs> i'm like sorry oh, perfect <laughs> I'll no, take I mean, maybe i should start faking a boston accent more heavily just to keep people uh you do know it, on par i love the boston accent <laughs> wicked hard kid it's wicked hard yeah, that's great that's great <laughs> <laughs> uh, what time is it for you it is 9 30 p.m oh yeah that's late. not too late yeah. yeah, it's seven thirty for me. So we're we're yeah. both we're both sacrificing on either side of the day to get stuff done. But right. um, right. no, man, I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here because uh, for a lot of reasons. One is as we were talking about before the podcast, we're always trying to get better uh, men's content on because we know obviously I come from men's gymnastics and so do you, and it's an important you know part to our heart, and we want to make sure that people have access to great information. But also, it's it's more challenging to find a lot of great mag content. You know, it's just a reality of the way the world works with women's gymnastics and coaching and you know popularity it's just unfortunately challenging sometimes to find really good high quality men's content so um, i'm trying to get people on all the time and obviously you were very well received at the symposium and so i think i just wanted to ride the coattails of good chats and information and try to just pull out as much value as we possibly can from someone like yourself who has a lot of experience sounds good matt thanks appreciate it yeah um and let's let's kind of go here first so let's first talk about the most uh discussed question which is corralling a bunch of eight to 10 year old wild animals that are boys <laughs> to get them to try to focus and do gymnastics. I think before we talk about drills and technical and all kind of stuff like that for sure is the hardest challenge that a lot of people ask me about is like, yo, how do I organize a practice when these like yeah. wild monsters are running around? Like I think like seven to 10 is so brutal sometimes. And I know you work with a lot of young guys, so I'd love to hear your thoughts there first. Yeah, it's actually probably it's one of my favorite ages to coach because of like the the energy that you got to bring to it. But it's definitely it's definitely hard work. Like I finish one of those sessions and I feel like I've been coaching my seniors the same like five five hours in seniors is like one hour with the little guys. So um, probably a couple couple of key points with that. Like the first thing is you have to bring just a ton of energy. So kids get bored really quickly so you have to be like the shiny object so we have birds in australia called magpies and uh they like to collect like shiny things and put them in their nests like they get attracted to shiny things so you know I've, i always kind of tell coaches that i work with you have to be the, the shiny object you have to be more interesting than all of these crazy distractions that are in our environment so there are some things you can do just like on a on a like a way to make it the environment less entertaining just by like how you position the athletes when you get them to like line up and you're about to explain a circuit um don't have someone behind you on a trampoline doing flips you know try to put it so you've got like a blank wall behind you it depends on the gym and how you how you kind of do that um boys also they they need discipline but you need to find a way to drip feed discipline in in like a like a fun way so i try to think of it kind of like um training a group of athletes to eventually be very disciplined i start with just more crazy fun stuff and it's like a sleight of hand trick where you just slowly take out that little bit of fun and replace it with a little bit of hard work and then fun 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 hard work fun 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 discipline and then eventually it's more like hard work discipline hard work discipline fun you know you just you slowly yeah. swap it out like that yeah um other things that i try to do is i come up with lots of um like fast-paced fun activities so if i set up a circuit where the athletes move from one apparatus to another i don't have them stay at that apparatus or at that at that bit of the circuit that station for more than say 15 to 30 seconds while they're young so Mm -hmm. i'll either do it where they'll do a certain number of exercises and they move on straight away so they're just kind of flowing around the circuit naturally or i'll call rotations but I almost always have a stopwatch in my hand or a timer set up that actually reminds me to rotate people because I find that what I'll start to do is I'll start to help one athlete and it goes for too long and we're like 45 seconds to a minute in. And if you look around, everyone else has like stopped being engaged and they've stopped working and they're starting to like set fire to things and you know, <laughs> tearing the gym down. So keeping them occupied is a great way to keep the, the kind of the discipline there. And then I've got one little hack that I'll, that I'll give people as well um, to get boys in particular to like line up quickly. 
what I do, any this is the one of the first things I do with any young group of kids that, that I get. Like if I start a group of four or five year old pre competitive boys, they learn this straight away. Is I'll put my arm out straight and I'll count down like five, four, three, two, one, and they have to like just zoom in and line up, and they get it wrong. And I'll actually sometimes I'll make it on purpose hard, like I'll I'll move away from them and then put my arm out. So they don't get there in time and I spread them out and we all do push-ups or something together. So we do, some, I do it with them. So we do some sort of like conditioning punishment or something. And then I get back up and I, I move somewhere else to make it hard again. And I put my hand out. So I make it really challenging for them to actually ever get there in time. And I'll, I'll set it up basically because I'm the one who controls the count, right? So, and I've been doing this for a while. So I'll make them fail like four or five times quite rapidly and then I'll let them succeed. And I'll even do things like they'll have to line up along a beam under my arm or something like that. So it's it makes it a game. And then we get to the next apparatus and we're doing things and then I'll put my hand out and I do the five, four, three, two, one and they won't get there straight away. They'll, they'll be a little bit slow the first couple of times you do it. But if you start that at the beginning of the session and you do it four or five times as like a, a fun game and it's a challenge and, you know, you're not yelling at them because they're too slow. You're just like, oh, no, sorry, didn't get it. Let's go do push-ups. Yeah. Um, eventually what you end up with is, is you put your hand out, you start counting down from three and they just zoop in there really quick. And it looks super impressive for like other coaches and parents and stuff like that. It looks like mm. you've got like magic powers, but it's, it's pretty formulaic. You can do it really easily. Yeah, I dig that. And something I definitely want to kind of, we, we glazed over quick, but I want to go back to is I think when you mentioned like bringing the energy and like, you know, like you said, it doesn't have to be someone who's like bouncing off the walls, like jumping all over the place. You can have a, a coach who's a little bit more mellow, but just like, it's more about like actually caring, which sounds awful yeah. you know, to say out loud, but it means like bringing energy, bringing energy could also mean preparing and having a lesson plan and like researching before and understanding what you're going to do, what drills you want to do, what's the goal, being excited for them as well as the actual competitions and training and stuff. And what that requires though, is you have to, you know, again, seems simplistic, but easier said than done is like, you kind of have to have your own personal life and your own life outside the gym, like under control. You have to sleep well, you have to take care of your health. You have to exercise. You have to actually, you know, give a crap about yourself to have energy to bring into the gym. Like, again, it's, it sounds you know, unfortunately kind of like uh, cliche, but like you can't deliver energy if you have no energy to give, right? Like if you come in the gym, yeah, sure. like half, half in the bag, literally or metaphorically, right? And you're just like tired and you're kind of sitting on blocks and you're checking your phone and you're kind of just like, oh, just like go do your stuff or like go do your strength, like good luck with any athlete, but let yeah. alone younger athletes, like that's just not gonna happen. So there's a lot of discipline needed on your part to be healthy enough and in a good mood to bring energy to the athletes. Well, another thing that I learned at IGC that um, I've, I've it, at the time, I didn't like, but it's something that I value more than any other thing that I learned at IGC was we first got to the camp and they tell you, if you sit down once while you're coaching, we will send you home. <laughs> there will be no warnings. You yeah. will go home and you'll only be paid for the time that you've been here. And then you get like one of the people that have been here for a few years, they come up to you and they say like, hey guys, like just letting you know, they're, they're actually serious about that. Don't test that. Like they're actually really serious. They've done it before. I saw it two years ago, that kind of thing. And then you go, oh, okay, damn. So, you know, it's a summer and I was, uh, at one point I was incredibly sick and I was sleep deprived, but I never sat down while I was coaching and you'd be coaching for like seven, eight hours a day. Um, and when now at, at the gym, I just, I just don't sit down while I coach. And I, I kind of a bit of a soapbox moment, but I really don't think any coach should. I think if you're, if you're at the gym and you're working with a group of athletes, you should, they, they need to work really hard. Like if you want to produce some good results and stuff, the kids should be almost constantly working with very little downtime. I know there's also, you know, certain energy systems, like if you're training vault, you're going to need to have a little bit more rest to get enough power. Um, but still, I think kids should be working like very rapidly, especially at a young age. Um, so my rule with the athletes, I think is, is pretty fair. I, I tell them that they're allowed to sit down when I'm sitting down mm. and then I don't sit down. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. And with a caveat here of, of course, like this is intuitive, but like, obviously if you have like a medical problem, like a raging, oh, yeah. like, like that, I just, I feel the comment section already brewing on Instagram. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, I have, it's like, okay, we get it. Like we're empathetic yeah. humans. We understand that. But, but if you're sitting down, cause I, I did have that actually, I was, uh, I dislocated my knee and actually came in after, after visiting the hospital, I actually went in and I coached that same day. Um, and yes, I was sitting down and stuff like that, but I'm still engaged. Like I wasn't sitting 100%. down and switching off, which is 100%. when I see a coach sitting down normally, they're also looking disengaged so yeah, yeah absolutely if, if someone has a, a real reason to sit down that's fine yeah and, and this comes with just like this has to start from the top of the gym right like you as a leader yeah. or somebody else like there's just like basics right like yourself you shouldn't have yourself on the floor you should be wearing a staff shirt at all times you shouldn't sit down unless you have something that's like medically necessary right like it's just basic codes of practice that like 
trickled quite a bit. And I think particularly yeah. even with the like the cell phone one is wild to me. Like it's, it's crazy to me to think that somebody would ever bring their phone out and be like literally texting or looking at their Apple watch in the middle of practice, sending messages like, bro, like, yeah. if, like put the music on the iPad or like use your a separate company iPad to take video and stuff like you don't need to have your phone. Like the second you start texting people on your phone, it's like extremely like distracting to someone. So yeah. I don't know how we got to this, this pocket of conversation, but let's go, let's go back to, so, okay, you got that. We got like moving the stations well, lining up is a pretty kind of fun hack. And I think it actually makes sense. What are some of the things you're doing? Like you talked about like the fun, fun, fun discipline and then turning that into like discipline, hard work, discipline, hard work, fun. Like what yeah. are the fun things that you're still doing? Like the lineup game, like what other things do you do to keep the morale up? Because especially like as these younger yeah. kids get to puberty, it's very hard yeah. to keep them in the gym and excited and engaged and stuff like that. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, like how I kind of like hide it, the sleight of hand is stuff like um, my young kids often start on the trampolines, um, just depending on our rotations. But we, we sometimes start with about half an hour on the trampolines. And I have a circuit that I set up, which uh, goes from like they're doing stuff on a trampoline. Then they go into some mats where they're practicing just some basic back drops and front drops and maybe introduce twisting and stuff before they land. So kind of like not actual trampoline stuff, but preparation for trampoline. Uh, then I've got a station where they stretch and I've got a station where they do like some parallel strength and then, and then they go back onto the trampoline. And so they circuit around. So I, I don't actually now focus much when I'm with the guys on the parallel strength stuff. Um, it just kind of chips away because I've taught them over time. Minimum is five second holds. They know all the different exercises that they're doing. I don't even have it written down. And some of them tend to do ones they like a bit more, uh, but that's kind of okay because what ends up happening is they'll they'll end up doing like some really sizable, strong quality work in holding all of these positions like V-sits and presses and planches and that kind of stuff. Um, and then, but they don't notice that they're really doing much of it because it's all in a circuit that's quite fun that they really enjoy. It's like tied in with that. So as a result, like I've got a group of um, eight-year-olds that have been training for about a year in gymnastics and uh, and most of them are starting to figure out press to handstands and, and V-sit work and, and all this kind of stuff without much emphasis on that in our day-to-day -day training. So that would be one example. Um, the other one that I really like, I, I call it, uh, this is something I was going to talk about when we got to like what an athlete, what things athletes should have, right, uh, is, is confidence, right? An athlete needs to be confident and part of having confidence when you're doing skills is knowing how to fail those skills and stay safe. So I'm really big on teaching athletes how to fall safely yeah. everywhere. You know, there's there's never a time where I will get an athlete to try a skill that they haven't been taught how to fail at first, right? Yeah. I always start with the failing and the falling first, and then I incorporate that into how I teach it. Like swing the handstands on P-bars. The first thing we start by learning to fall first. Um, and, we, and we very gradually build up to actually swinging a handstand. And then, you know, we're talking about how we make it fun. For the athletes, we do this uh, this thing on P bars. I call it failure training, um, like as a little bit of like a wink to you know the fact that failing is not actually bad. It's something that we're trying to get good at and all that kind of stuff. But I just basically have a whole series of things I do with the athletes just to get them more confident on the P bars, uh, like stuff like just walking across the P bars on their feet, mm -hmm. eventually walking across one rail on their feet, and they've learned to fall either way. So if they fall to the left, maybe they've got a, a second rail there, so they know how to jump over it, right. land and roll. Right. And all that kind of stuff. So that's another example of fun. It's not necessarily going to uh, revolutionize their gymnastics like right now. Like it's not a skill that they're going to be competing, um, but it's good fun. And I'm actually getting something out of it. Yeah, it's interesting you said that, too, because it's uh, it's generally not the missing of a skill someone is worried about. They're scared of what happens on the other side, which is eating yeah. it. You know what I mean? And I think it's 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 wild, too. We I didn't think about it till now, but we always taught, you know, like girls like giants is obviously a, a thing they they learn pretty young and it's important. But for guys, too, like. If you've never had somebody overcast and half turn and fall and roll out or miss back and fall this way into the pit or on the, and know how to come out of that, like that's yeah. terrifying. And all it takes is literally one, one yeah. kind of miss a quarter giant and they like fall back the other way. They don't know what to do. They panic. They fall on their back. They get scared. They tuck through into the cat position. Like you have to teach them how to, like you say, safely fall in multiple ways in multiple situations before you ever expect them to try to just do 50 swing to giants or in a, in a, in a strap bar or something like that. That's super yeah. important and not often talked about, I think. One time I, I was working with an athlete. I, it was someone else's athlete. I was around at the time. Uh, this is at my last club. And he was trying to do pivots on the P-bars, right? Just a simple half pivot. He was quite a good athlete. He had a solid handstand, but was like not making any progress. He kept stepping and then falling kind of like towards his stomach side. Mm. And, and he did it like turn after turn after turn. Like I watched him just fail this 10 times the exact same way, like fell the same way every single time. And I asked him, have you ever just like tried to fall over the other way? 
He's like, oh, no, 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 I don't think I don't think I have. I said, just just like step and fall over. And he did that and he was fine. And then the next one, he got his pivot, like immediately. Yeah. Because the fear, he was he was scared of what would happen if he went too far one way. Mm, so right. he always felt the other way. As right. soon as he experienced, actually, it's not that bad if I go that way too much, yeah. uh, it solved it. It fixed it like almost immediately. So mm. that one, that was actually, I, I figured that out pretty early on. And that was one of those ones that kind of solidified it in my head. So yeah. now a lot of my coaching, I try to like see, are they struggling with this skill because they're not physically prepared enough or not technically prepared enough? Or is there just some fear there that's holding them back? Because often I'll get someone who I, I know they've got good basic swings. Man, their, their handstands are strong. Why are they afraid to swing a handstand on P-bars? Um, and I find out we do a drill called a safety fall off P-bars where they actually fall. They do a shoulder stand position and then they fall directly through the bars, like which sounds scary. But if you've trained the athletes to fall like that way over and over and over again, and they've done a thousand repetitions, it's very safe. Um, I think it's the, actually the safest way to fall from handstand if you're in the P bars. What what I sometimes do is I have an athlete and I've seen them swing the handstand like for, for ages, but then suddenly they start to look really hesitant in in handstands. They look like they're not confident. They stop hitting it and holding it. They might get there and then come back down straight away. Uh, and I and I kind of drill into it and I ask them like, when was the last time you actually practiced one of those safety falls? And it turns out they haven't done it in months because they've gotten good enough at handstands that they've done that. And then in their head, they start to forget that they can fall and they yeah. start to play it really safe again. And as soon as you get them to practice the fall, almost straight away, you get really aggressive swing the handstands again. Yeah, I think there's a really important undertone here, which is unfortunately something a lot of coaches are, I think, missing here is like the difference in under the critical thinking skills to understand, like, why is this skill not happening? Is this not happening because of a physical preparation limitation? And within that bucket, you could say, like, is this a flexibility problem? Is this a strength problem? Is this like a raw strength problem? Are they simply just not strong enough? Or are they simply lacking the flexibility to get into the position they need to be successful? It's like, yeah. is this a, is a physical preparation problem? Or is this a fear problem and a mental, you know, a mental thing? Or is this a technical understanding like do they simply not understand what you're asking them to do and I think oftentimes I see someone who will like very quickly jump to the conclusion that like you're just not flexible enough or like well you're just like you just got to go you just got to figure you just got to do it like you just got to be mentally tougher when in reality like yeah. have you ever stopped to be like do you know where to put your hands do you know where to look yeah. do you understand what you actually are being asked to do here and oftentimes like younger kids really don't they really don't understand like my hand should go here on a pivot or a pirouette, right? They don't yeah. understand I should look here when I take off for a back full or something like that. So I think as coaches, we're sometimes not maliciously, but we just lack the empathy to understand like there's multiple reasons this could not be going well. And let's take a pause here and figure this out before we just yeah. keep hammering away the same thing. And yeah, yeah, I just think I see that in like you and Nick and many of the people is that critical thinking step to stop and think about, okay, why before just blowing yeah. a bunch of drills at someone? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if you can figure out where what the actual problem is, what's that first domino that's falling over that you need to keep upright, if you can figure that out, that's that's the the key to really efficient coaching, I think. Yeah, and sometimes that one bottleneck impacts many things, right? Like knowing visual cues where to look or like some kid who's growing and has terrible, you know, shoulder flexibility. If you could just spend a couple of weeks and work on that, like so many things would get better. Your handstand, ring yeah. swings, everything would get better. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. All right, let's go on to next, the actual meat and potatoes people want to know about, which is like the technical stuff. Let's try to talk about what what are the things as a younger generation coach, like in the, again, the seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, kind of, or even pre-competitive if you want, like, what do you feel like as a coach, like, all right, I have to nail these things well if I want to keep them safe and also have a really good potential down the road for them to continue to make progress? Cool. So we've covered falling already, so we'll, we'll leave that one. Um, I'm a big fan of V-sits and manas. Um, do you guys have the, the same words in, in America? Yeah. So I, I think they're really important for male gymnasts because uh, if you just take the mana position where the hips are all the way up level with the shoulders, if you just hold that position with their upper body and then imagine if their legs were out straight, um, that would be like an amazing pommel circle, right? Like they would have really good extension through their shoulders. Their hips would be really high. So mana, I think, has a really strong correlation between, you know, who can do a good mana and who's got good circles. Also, P-bar swings, you're going to need really good high swings on P-bars. There's a lot of skills that um, you can do on high bar that come from that, like Steinman and Adler's. There's a few of these skills like jams. You know, you, I think in America you call it jams or takamotos. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Yeah. So a lot of these skills like mana becomes very important. So for all of those reasons, I'm a big fan of V-sits and manas. I also think we do so much pushing forward. I know you talk about this. We do so much anterior work. Um, if you focus a lot on some like, you know, posterior work, I think that really helps to balance the shoulder and will potentially allow a male gymnast to get even stronger at the front because they're a little bit more balanced in the back. 
So I think that's really important. Um, handstand balance and press to handstands, that's really obvious, of course. But I think even more so maybe than women's gymnastics, guys really, really, really need good solid handstands because you think about in, in women's gymnastics, where, where do they actually have to hold the handstands? If they're once they're like a senior gymnast, I, I don't actually know if they really need to, do they? They need to have control on bars to be out of turn. But is there any time they actually have to statically stay there? Yeah, there's like a few beam mounts and some other things, but it's, it's much yeah. less than guys. Whereas on P bars, every skill you do is going to finish in a handstand. <laughs> Literally, you know, in on rings, we again, most skills finish in a handstand. You have giants, you have Yamawakis, you have back uprises. Like a lot of skills go to handstand, and of course, then you've got the swinging skills on high bar. So handstand and being really proficient at balancing in a handstand, I think, is is crazy important for young guys. So I spend a lot of time focusing on that and working on alignment and developing strength there. Um, we've done learning to fall everywhere. Um, I also think about what, what do I want to look for with like young guys when you're talent IDing because I think a lot of the problems that you, you'll see with an older generation of athletes, um, you know, if you talent ID well, you end up with, you know, less less things that you've got to correct later on. So I'm, I'm big into talent ID. So I look for a lot of energy. So I often end up with um, the really, we're talking about crazy kids, I end up with a lot of the really high energy crazy kids because if they have a lot of energy, they'll, if you can channel it, <laughs> they'll have more turns and they'll get more work done and they'll get more repetitions in. So I really like high energy kids. Um, they need to have very strong core. So I do like hanging on a bar. I test L hang, V hang and candle. Uh, and I'll maybe spot the athlete at first, but I'll test that anytime I'm talent IDing a young kid, it might be that we start with bent legs and can they put one leg out straight like an L? And then can they do the other leg? Can they do both legs? I might lift their legs up to V and then see if there's any sort of ability to keep their feet there when I start to move my hand away. Um, and then candle often is one that's a bit harder, but if you get a kid who can naturally do a candle, like a four or five year old um, kid who can hold a candle naturally, that kid's going to be a bar worker. Like he's going to be really good at bars. So I look for that kind of stuff, that core general coordination, uh, as well as the ability to like adapt and make a change. So I'll get like a kid to do a forward roll on the floor and then maybe they put their hands behind them as they stood up out of the forward roll. Uh, if I give them that cue, can you reach forward? Like we're not going to touch the floor with our hands, reach forward this time. If they can make that change straight away, that's also another good indicator that they can they can be a good gymnast. Obviously, you know, you, you take this with a grain of salt. If they're young kids, they might be a good gymnast anyway, but it's just the, the things that I look for if I'm trying to build up a, a competitive program. Um, they should be very fast twitch, which means they can sprint well and they can bounce really well. Uh, and they can make uh, like skill adjustments. We talked about skill adjustments. And then probably the last thing is I don't actually care that much about flexibility um, because I, while yes, it is great when you have a kid who comes in naturally is super bendy. Um, also, that kid normally lacks a lot of strength uh, and, and also has those joints that are a little bit, uh, yeah, they scare me a little bit. Like if they start hyperextending their lower back too much or if the shoulders just roll a little bit too much and there's not much strength there. I think um, more important than flexibility is if you've got someone who's got a tough mindset and you train them well uh, and they've been taught how to stretch correctly and how to like push themselves in a, in a healthy way so they're not going too far, but they are still being quite tough. I think over time, like male gymnasts, you can basically make anyone flexible. It's just, it just takes more work. And if you have a very stiff, naturally strong, but stiff athlete and you put the work in to make them flexible, that kid's a monster then, you know, that kid's really, really going to be very powerful and like dynamic and movable. Yeah, I agree on the flexibility point. I definitely want to jump in there because I think still there's been a lot of really good work by myself and others to translate the dorky stuff from the research world into what actually works. Like we have a pretty good idea of what you should do week by week to gain flexibility. We kind of understand like two sets of 30 seconds of either static stretching or active flexibility or PNF, like they all work, but you have to consistently yeah. do them and you have to make sure it's a muscular based stretch, not a joint laxity. So if you get a good screen and someone who understands how to screen out what the main issue is, and you consistently work on stuff over time and you give it four weeks, not like four hours, it actually makes a long distance of time with the comma there of like, except the fact that they're 10 and they're growing and you can't yeah. outpace biology. Like patience really is the key. Sometimes it's like, yo, slow down and just work at it. It's going to get better when you become 12, yeah. 13, 14, you'll be great on the other side of it. But yeah, I agree. I think the majority of the stuff that is still out there is not being used. I think we're still very much stuck in 
over splits and just passive stretching. But like, there's so much good information that says a, a very different approach to flexibility can really help someone maintain or gain a lot of range of motion. So I actually agree with you a lot there. And back to the other pieces, I want to go back to kind of these key sets is, so can you give us one to two drills that you really like for V sits and for manas, and then we'll do some handstand balancing work. Cause I'm sure people want some like tactical yep. actual actions. So so for v sits uh, and manas, the first thing you need is is just pike flexibility. I would say. So uh, my favorite thing for pike flexibility is like hanging on a wall bar. Um, so just holding onto a wall bar, putting your feet a couple of rungs below, and hanging low. Uh, if you do nice long sets of thirty seconds, I don't tend to go to a minute, but if I've got an athlete who's holding themselves up really high, you can maybe make them do it for a little bit longer because their arms get tired and then they start to actually stretch properly. Um, but hanging like that. And then I call these active lifts. So sitting on the floor, putting your hands next to your knees and then just lifting up and down They're They're very basic exercises. They're terrible though. <laughs> they're so hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have vivid memories um, of being at the bottom of a dip and doing those both crying when I was oh, little kid because they were so hard. Just oh, like, I get Bottom it. of a dip and then you have to lift up and down. No, no, just two separate yeah. memories. One is like okay. my coach, my coach was amazing. I love him to death, but yeah. I was being a little bit of a drama. And I was just at the bottom. I was like, I can't do anymore. And then another time <laughs> doing compression lifts and wall walk-ups. We so many wall walk ups yeah. as kids but anyways go ahead <laughs> <laughs> so so those are those are two really like good ones so pike stretching and then active lift and then for the uh actually the best way for v-sit though is if you're working on all of that stuff and that's getting better over time putting them uh putting like a block or something i usually do a lot of v-sit work on parallettes so i'll be sitting on little parallettes on the floor and i'll have like a block often we're in the pommel area pommel and p-bars are next to each other at my gym so i might have the mushroom in front of them and they have to start with their legs apart in a straddle and they have to lift their legs up and put them together and then come back down. So they have to try. Initially, they might just see if they can touch it and come back down without putting their feet on the block. Uh, eventually, I'm, I'm looking for three-second hold minimums. And I'll tell the kids after they've been with me for a while, if it's less than three seconds, it doesn't count. You did nothing. Like, you know, it's three seconds or it doesn't it doesn't have an effect. So it's, it's zero. So, um, yeah, they lift up, they hold for three seconds. And then I either make the thing bigger or I move them closer to it. So over time, they just, if they successfully hold for three seconds, I tell them they just, they always have to just move that little bit closer. And then they try it again and they might struggle, 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 then they can hold it and then they move a bit closer. And so over time, I, I end up with like, we, we have a five year old who's doing a V sit, like, and he's actually starting to do manas and stuff now. Um, and that's just through that consistent, like, that's just a side station that I put very little thought into. I just every now and then look over there and encourage them and, you know, say, hey, all oh, guys, have a look at how high Josh has got today. And then everyone else tries that a little bit harder when they get there because they got a bit of praise. Um, so, yeah, for V sits, I think that's that's the main one. Yeah. And, and to that, another point just popped in mind too, is like back to the flexibility conversation is if you're doing the other things well, whether it's like soft tissue work, proper stretching, whatever, the best way to actually maintain some of your flexibility is by doing a load of these, these loaded movements, right? For female gymnastics, it's usually like theraband kicks and jumps for guys. It is good P bar swings. It's good pommel swings. Yeah. It's good mana work. Like that's how you maintain that range of motion. And it also works with a lot of like eccentric overload, which we know is a really good way to get some, some yeah. length through here as well. So yeah, all this stuff is kind of wrapping up and making some dots connect, but that's can, good. Can and I get, can I jump on the eccentric please, overload bit? Please, um, please. So if uh, you can also take like a furniture slider, put it against the wall, make a kid shuffle their butt in. So they're in like a V sit position with their hands behind them. And they're basically sliding their feet up. And I'll often spot this a little bit, but they're sliding their feet up through kind of a V sit towards a mana, but with their legs vertical, if that makes sense. Um, I, I call them wall slides because I'm very yeah. creative. Yeah. Um, and what, what I do is um, eccentric overload, I think is huge with that. Cause you can get a kid to try that by themselves, but they'll go to whatever range they're strong enough to do and they can't go any further. And you don't really ever see them get better. Like the range never really increases, I, I found. But if you then spot them up a bit and then slowly take your hands away and they have to isometrically hold for a little bit and then lower down in a negative and you do like five reps of that, it's brutal. It's really, really hard work. Uh, but all the guys that have been working on that are suddenly starting to swing really high on P-bars and feeling strong. Like one of my athletes who's like 17, so he's kind of old enough now that, you know, he, he'll he notice when we do physical prep and then something gets easier. He'll like, be, hey, I, I can actually swing really well now. Like that actually made my swing so much better, you know, which is good. So it's good to have that feedback from them. And another like kind of additional hack to help people out is if you have someone who's really stiff on like the front swing of parallel bars, the front swing of pommels, they can't open their shoulders really well. You can do the exact same situation where you can have someone do – five sliders on the ground first so lift their hips up and slide out fully for five yeah. seconds and hold for like the bottom do five reps of that before you go over and you spot them and then when they go on the wall they have more range to push through so that mm -hmm. can help out a lot because obviously gravity is not as uh the vector of gravity is not so demanding when you're on your 
horizontal axis. Yeah. You can do five on your own and get really good open shoulder flexibility and then tip it upright and go upright. Those back to back is extremely helpful for guys who are stiff, like arms behind the back. I'm adding that in. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it. Isn't it funny when you make the the names of drills literally exactly what they are? Because you can't, it's like, yeah. let's do a, let's do a feet elevated wall slider up the wall with a spot. <laughs> it's like, yeah. And it becomes quite long. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, God dang, this is so long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What I'm, what I'm looking at doing now, so I'm going to work for skills, but I want to prescribe for my guys a little bit more sequence work based on their routines. Yeah. Um, and, I've, and I used to write it all out, but now what I'm going to start doing is just scripting because I'm a judge as well. So I do know like all the, I'm just going to script and they're going to have to learn how, what symbols are. It's so much more efficient than <laughs> writing it all out. I can just do a squiggle. We have a, a friend of mine, Dan Pope, shout out. He's a, one of the best physical therapists I've ever worked with, but he has this bad tendency of when he writes his notes and we have to take a patient because he's like on vacation, it literally just says exactly what the exercise is. And it's so hard to follow. It's like single leg box step up with two kettlebells to a two inch lift on top of one inch down. And you're like, dude, this is so painful to watch. <laughs> anyway, nice. um, okay. And so that's that one. Let's go some handstand balancing and like kind of press handstand drills. Like, what do you like for those? So there's, there's two main things for, uh, for handstand balancing that I found like really, really helpful. Um, f- well, first, first, before, before we talk about that is, um, crimping the hands I, I talk about. So, uh, this is going to be really hard for people that are listening auditorily, but if you put your hands flat on a surface, you should then, uh, kind of bend your fingers so that the middle knuckle goes up, but the other two knuckles are down right can you yeah yeah like that like that so and then but make sure that the the palm knuckle is like pushing really hard into the ground yeah so that's actually something i I started to look into like what the best thing to do with your hands are because like hand balances are often like amazing at balancing on one hand so there has to be some secrets so basically you just you're shortening the fingers and it gives better leverage for like all your wrist muscles and stuff so that's one of the first things my, my athletes always have pointer fingers parallel with each other, spread the hands out and they claw the floor. Um, and that that's the first thing. If you start doing that and you consistently get that, you'll, you'll start to have some good balances quite naturally. I found, uh, the second thing is I do what's called a chest to wall handstand. But when I say that it's just the chest. So the athlete walks in really close and they get their hands within maybe like an inch of the wall. It's the closer, the better. If you go too close, when they push tall, they'll fall over. But what I want to do is I want to find that sweet spot where there is, they're as close as they can possibly be and still make a straight line and the body will want to fall away, but their fingers are strong enough to hold it. So, so what ends up happening is they can work on their really good alignment, straight body, but the body just starts to naturally tap on the wall. It doesn't rest on it. It starts to fall away from it and the fingers get a lot of strength built up just by holding it. And they actually start to to get in their brain because they'll start to fall off and they stay off for a little bit before they go back on. It's a really good way to just gradually trickle in some balance. So whenever my athletes do uh, handstand holds on the wall, that's actually how they do it. We do chest to wall handstand holds. With younger kids, they won't have the ability to stay straight enough. They'll end up just arching. So I don't I don't do that until they can hold a fairly straight handstand. Um, Then the last one that I really like for handstand balancing is to then do the opposite, move the hands further away from the wall, maybe like a foot, a foot and a half away from the wall. Then they put one leg on the wall, the other leg vertical, and they they lean their shoulders forward, kind of like a press and just very, very, and the key here is very slowly, the foot falls off the wall just a little bit. Right. And then if they if they start to lose their balance, I tell them to put their foot back on the wall. They lean and they slowly come off the wall. I think I call them like wall tappers or something. Yeah, Um, floaters or something, yeah. Yeah. And the goal there is, is almost like I took this from, um, from a, a yoga teacher who was doing handstands. I was, I was getting into yoga for a little bit and there was a yoga teacher who had some handstand stuff and his way of explaining it. I really quite liked it. It was almost meditative. Like you want to find that moment where you've got 99% of your weights on your hands, but 1% on the wall. So you're still technically leaning on the wall and then you lean just far enough that the body goes to hundred percent of your weight and you just float there and you want to feel that moment and get really good at that because that's basically where your best balance point is. So we do a lot of a lot of work on that. Also, the the benefit there is a kid they they will sometimes fall over so that they like have to roll out of it. But what I'm trying to get them to do is always fall back to the wall because then they can actually be balancing again within about two seconds. So you get a lot more repetitions in than if you put them on the floor and they have to kick up and try to hold. If they if they fall quickly there, often they don't get back up and do another handstand for at least ten seconds. So it's a much less efficient way to fit in a lot of training. You can you can get much better at balancing handstands if you start near the wall. So my athletes actually get sent back to the wall if I'm seeing if they see them fall a couple of times after holding for less than ten seconds, they have to go back to the wall. 
Mm. because I just it's just too it's not efficient enough I want I want eight-year-old boys who can kick up and hold a handstand for a minute so like just balancing so if we're going to get that we're going to have to use the wall and be really efficient with how we train yeah no those are all super helpful and I think some of those I've, I've had some idea of them but it was good clarity there around a couple of specific ones um and I think core you kind of covered right like the compression the l the v I'm curious if you can maybe expand we'll kind of talk on the next point which is developing like really good swings because I think that's another thing that a lot of people really struggle with is just getting like a really good high bar swing a really good pommel swing yeah. a really good parallel bar swing a really good ring swing and then they are constantly having to either work around that limited swing or they can't really develop the things they want down the road skill wise so yeah i'd love to hear your thoughts on maybe let's talk like long hang swings and then like maybe yeah. front swings for parallel bars and p-bars yeah so the first step you do is you buy your shift uh, symposium pass and you go and you watch the video <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's first thing um because well just honestly that that breaks down a lot of the physical preparation for this stuff yeah. because um one thing one of the reasons why i resonated a lot with your content and i think the reason why you know i'm on this this now is because of how many questions i've pepped you with over the years and, and sure. we've talked a fair bit sure. um you need to get really good shoulder flexibility for for bars so right um, nick's whole thing about the 20 dimensions of a straight line in handstand or <laughs> whatever it is um you need to be able to hang really really long so i think mm. that's one of the first things is most athletes are a little bit stiff and they create a, a slight gap between their shoulder and their ears yep. you need to be able to extend as much as possible on the bar and the reason for that is when you've created as much length as possible, any movement in your body tugs on the bar. It creates a movement on the bar. So there's no slack. So if there is slack and they've got a, a gap in between their shoulders and their ears, um, they can they might start to do a tap and the bar won't immediately be pulled. The slack might go first and then the bar gets tugged. And so you end up with less of an action. That's one thing is you will get less of a biomechanical action and reaction from the bar. But the other thing is, the gymnast isn't fully kind of connected to the bar. They're a little bit out of sync with it. And so what you'll often end up happening is their tap timing will be wrong for things like giants and flyaways and any skill that you want to do. You'll end up with athletes that you, you, you see some people who have that amazingly long line and they also just have incredible timing. Like they'll, they'll look, they'll look natural on bars, right? That's, that's what we like. But part of why they're natural is because they have that long line. You know, that's, that's what helps them to feel the bar and feel the bounce of the bar. Yeah. And especially at high level men's, that's how you do Kovacs and stuff, right? Someone you just came to mind is, do you know Justin Spring from the US? Yeah, love Justin Spring. He's like, a, he's like a perfect example of someone who's got that really long, like you would think would be challenging to do, but like he's one of the best high bar workers of all times. I think yep. he's such a long, crazy swing and Justin is an absolute nut in terms of like energy <laughs> levels. But like, I think yep. one of the reasons he was so successful is he developed a phenomenal, really long bounce of the bar mm -hmm. in sync with his long body. And I, that has yeah. to be just years of, of just drilling that. I remember, so just on a Justin Spring uh, anecdote, I was in IGC when I, I met Justin Spring as well. He was there at the camp, which was awesome because I, I really I really like him. He's, he's cool. Um, and he did like an underswing. So he went through the candle position on high bar and threw the bar and launched himself out over the pit. And he just sailed like an unimaginably long distance, caught a ring with one hand, like caught onto a ring with one. This is, He went so far, like literally like four meters, five meters. It was insane. And then just caught the ring with one hand, swung <laughs> casually to stand on a set of P-bars that was like just far enough that he could only just get there and just walked across the P-bars on one rail. Yeah. It was like Spider-Man had come into my gym. I was like, this is gymnastics. <laughs> he's just this built different, man. Did. That's why he's yeah, an Olympian. He's just built different. Oh absolutely he really is he's there's so a video of him doing triple pikes like off high bar too like old school videos oh no i haven't seen that one oh, but i think it was him or maybe it was jason fur i don't remember there's this like crazy video of this dude i have never seen someone tap so hard on a chinese tap in my life and just like either perfect timing of letting go or just having zero care for what happens like i've <laughs> never seen somebody rip so hard and he did a triple pike off like high bar into a pit and it was just like ridiculous but i digress nice. anyways um yeah Back to swings. So we have long yeah. extension to swings. Yeah. yeah, exactly. What else? Um, action reaction is one of these really important concepts. So the, the ability to make a shape, then stretch that shape and then go back to the shape. So the, the main way you guys talk about hollow a lot, right? Hollow in Australia, we call it dish, but hollowing on the back of the swing. And then as you go into the stretch and you go into an arch, do you guys call it an arch? Am I getting, am I getting, yeah. When you go into the arch, all of the muscles uh, at the front that were holding that dish are now being stretched and they're storing some elastic energy. And then you hold that. And then at the right time, you release that elastic energy by contracting the muscles and going back into the dish again. So I think a lot of coaches 
they they don't teach a couple of things here very well. One, they they often don't make the shape very specific. So a kid will make a dish, but it's like more like a rough, like a bad toddler drawing of a dish, not like an actual like technical artistic dish. It's a clay so, bowl. It's a low bowl. It's not a dish. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I think you need to be like very detailed with like making sure that the back is round, the hips are nice and flat, the core's engaged properly so the stomach's in. And the shape might be slightly different from gymnast to gymnast, but um, if you really look at it up for a long time, you start to just see patterns and you kind of know what you want to see. So hitting that position is really important. And then learning to then stretch that position correctly. So if someone's got stiff shoulders, they often won't open in the shoulders enough. So instead they'll use their lower back a lot um, or they'll kind of like kick and pike. Uh, often you'll also get, you, you'll know this, you get someone who's got tight anterior hips, right? Uh, they'll end up with a very, very archy lower back and tight shoulders. It'll often have a flow on effect. They get both. They get upstream and downstream tightness. So you can't, this is where I, I went back to physical preparation. You can't actually just say, you can't technically give enough feedback to fix that problem. You know what I mean? There's there's nothing a coach can magically say that will fix someone's swings if they don't have the range of motion in their body. So you have to keep going back to physical preparation. So a lot of bars for me is like, I'll tell them the shape that I want them to see, that, that I want to see. And then if they're still saying not rounding their back enough, I go and put them on the floor with like an ab wheel and they have to stretch out and stretch back while holding the, the round back that I want to see. So I go back, I always tie in whatever correction I'm giving. I tie it in with something that I think is going to help prepare them physically to actually do the skill properly. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really important distinction. I always have these like little, like, I don't know, one liners that come out. One is like, one, don't bring a technical solution to a cultural problem. Like that's a big one. But yeah. two is this one too, which is never bring a technical solution to a physical preparation problem. Like, like, yeah. like you said so well, if your kid literally can't get 180 degrees of shoulder flexibility and can't open their hips to, you know, 20 degrees minimum, um, there's no drill. There's no amount of uh, conditioning. Like there's nothing yeah. that's going to fix that until you literally just get them more mobile. And I'll give you the skip the other nine episodes on podcast episode of what needs to happen here. You need to get thoracic mobility, extension over a foam roller and windmills. You need to get lat and teres and pack flexibility with soft tissue work, foam rolling, proper stretching with a PVC stick stretch, hands behind the back table stretch, eccentric chin up lowers, eccentric sliders. Then you need to do upper back strength, face pulls twice a week, and you can do a lot of technical swings. That's how you get better shoulder flexibility if you want better. So just save nice. it two hours right there. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> dropping the mic. Um, the other one that I ha I don't think I've seen you teach in uh, your physical preparation. So may maybe it's you don't know about it, or maybe it's bad. Um, but it's one of my it's one of my go tos for, for alignment is um, hanging on a bar. Like you hold onto a bar that's maybe if you're standing up about shoulder height for you. Yeah. So you put your hand on the bar, and then you just hang sideways. So the yeah. body's in like a scooped banana thing sideways, and like try to dish the body. And this is where I also I always tie in active something active into the stretch. So the cue is my athletes are trying to push their arm off their body, like push as high as they can, or you yep. can tell them to try to imagine like pushing their hip down by, by pushing their hand up. Um, but that sideways stretch I found like really helps with stretching out the lat. Yeah, um, totally. And also, yeah, because also the lat kind of ties into like, you know, the, your side muscles, your obliques and stuff. Um, yep. If you've got athletes that are a bit archy, I often find that, that that helps. And then specifically when you start doing reverse grip stuff on, on bars, um like often you'll then get a really chest out position and they just can't round and that's that's yeah. i think because the lats are too tight so a lot yeah. of that sideways bending thing I've, i found really helpful yeah i agree and if you want one of the gnarliest drills to get overhead mobility to improve this is only for a very advanced athlete who can do this is actually a reverse grip tucked wall handstand so Ooh. your lats your lats essentially like you're saying they attach to the lower back it's called your thoracolumbar fascia and they wrap all the way up to the inside of your armpit so if you're winding up the lat from both ends by turning your palms backwards and then you're tucking and hollowing in by curling your knees up into a ball if you do that against a wall it's pretty much there's nowhere to run for flexibility so if you have an athlete who you're really trying to get advanced shoulder work have them do some reverse grip holds like i said though they're extremely hard just doing it on the ground with your palms flat is hard enough but um yeah if you want like steroid level you know shoulder flexibility active mobility drills that's like a, a very challenging one to do i've got one athlete in mind who's going to hate you because of, that, <laughs> because of giving me that idea and then just text it to yeah. me like this guy hates you <laughs> yeah <laughs> take a photo for you <laughs> it's all for love man it's because i want you to be good long term but yeah. um cool all right so we got um long hand swing so i guess is that kind of universal like I guess rings, high bar, under bar work. It's kind of all those same concepts of flexibility, creating length, timing of tapping. What about vision? Like, do you teach these kids like yes. exactly where to look at all times? 
that was going to be my next step. Yeah. So, so I do I, now I'm still playing around with stuff as a coach, because I know you said I have a lot of experience, but actually like I still very much consider myself a student of the sport. So I have ideas and things that I'll tell my athletes, like very like, no, this is how we're doing it. You know, this is, I, I believe this, but I also experiment a bit. So um, vision, for instance, is one of those things where I, I not like sold on exactly what I want them to do. I know a couple of things. One, I, I want the head to be fairly still. And I say fairly still because when they arch, I actually think the chin should lift slightly. And when they dish, I think the head should come in slightly. So the basically the head should follow the movement of the spine. Um, I think that's more of a natural looking tap. If the head's too stiff and still, I don't think that works very well. And the other thing that I'll just I'll just mention as well um, is the foam under the chin um, on like during swings. I hate it with a passion. I, I think it's the worst thing you can do for an athlete um, because every time that they do that, uh, we talked about the stretch shortening cycle. Um, the back of the neck is being stretched. And what it wants to do then is it wants to switch on. It wants to kick the head back. So you're storing all this elastic energy and then you change shape and the kid might want to do a flyaway or a flip. So they're already thinking about rotating and throwing their head backwards. You're almost always going to get that to go back. You're not when you've got something there tactilely, like a, something under their chin to hold on to, they might not throw their head. But what ends up happening once that goes away is and the coach stops nagging them or something or the athlete gets scared again or something, it goes back and the head, the head goes back again. Yeah, I've heard multiple people say this and I agree, right? Because one is I agree with you that like the, the reactionary is to whip the other way. But two is like when you watch a lot of skills, there are definitely some skills where a head tuck is needed. But like for a lot of skills, the position of like a, a triple chin backwards into a neutral position to get the chest around is more beneficial anyways, right? Like there's very few skills I can think of. You want to be staring down at the ground, just looking down this yeah. way. So like, yeah, I think, I think the, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's, we're definitely going to clip this and put it up on Instagram to get some like thoughts. Yeah. Cause like, I, I actually don't promote a lot of like the foam use under the chin. I think it's like, kind of like yeah. you're cheating. You're using something as a learning tool, which is good, but then it overcompensates into a pattern you can't undo. Like you don't want kids to leave the bar with their head completely buried, not looking where they're going. Yeah. Like, that's not a great idea. <laughs> And the other, the other thing for me is um, I honestly don't, I, I think about head position a lot, but my main way of fixing head position and cueing it for the athlete is, is talking about vision. Cause that's, that's how, like, if I tell you to look at your shoes, your head goes down, you look at your shoes. If I tell you to look at the roof, your head goes up. Like I might be able to, I can look up and I actually don't need to move my head and I can see the roof, but I don't do that. I just lift my head. So that's, that's something I, I talk a lot about and actually something I found out about recently, and I'm, I'm interested, this is nerdy science stuff that you might like, um, is I found out that the eyes have this, there's like an optical reflex where when the eyes look up, there's some muscles in the back of the neck, your occipital muscles or something like that, um, that actually want to switch on. It's like, it's a reflexive thing that they always, I think they always contract a bit. They'll always turn on, but it's not enough to create movement. But my thought is if you've got one, if you've, your head's down and they, they've got those muscles stretched, two, the athlete wants to look up because they want to see the bar. So they might start looking up even if they don't move their head. Um, you're switching on all those muscles and they're starting that little cascade of actually wanting to create movement with bigger muscles as well. So I'm, I'm talking a lot about eyes uh, with my guys right now. We're working a lot yeah, it, it's called, I'm pretty sure it's called the VOR. I'd have to go back to my nerdy, like, you know, nerdy, right. yeah. I think it's called your vestibular ocular reflex. And it's essentially a one to one pairing of, where your eyes go, your head goes the opposite. So if you're tracking something in front of you, if your head turns 45 degrees, your eyes turn 45 degrees to catch, to keep you in line because your brain wants to write in all directions at a point. So I'm pretty sure that is what we're talking about. But yeah, the other thing too is the really important distinction. I know we're getting the weeds here, but it's really important for technical development is like eyes versus head, right? Like, so Dave Durani, a really good friend of mine is like one of the best handstanders I've ever met in my life. And he always talks about like hands going up and eyes looking through the roof of your skull, but not having this, right? So like yes. you can make the same argument for down too as well. Like when you have someone take off on floor and I've watched Nick teach this is like eyes down on the floor is very different than head down with, with eyes neutral, right? So I can look yeah. down at the floor and see where I'm punching with my eyes down, but my head kind of level on a chin tuck versus like yes. looking down with my eyes straight ahead. Now my, like, can you imagine trying to take off for a double pike with your head all the way down, looking at the floor yeah. and your arms behind you? Like, good luck with that, bro. <laughs> it's going to be terrible. Yeah. Plus like when the, when the head's in, right, your T-spine is a bit more rounded normally, right? Like, yeah. so, so you get less extension through the shoulders. So that's the other thing on that moment of release in a flyaway. If you've taught it well, the athlete should really be pushing quite hard backwards on the bar. Um, so you're trying to create rotation over, but then you're pushing back against the bar to create lift. Mm. And if they've got the head buried, they can't push back much. So that's also when I start to see flyaways that don't move away from the bar and they start coming towards the bar, even mm. though the head's in. 
yeah, it's terrible. Don't be yeah. <laughs> and, and on this, I do want to actually, I wasn't going to talk about this, but you did have a really good point when I was watching your lecture at the symposium about like the need to really teach these pieces to a flyway well, because bro, I've hit my, I've had many days of hitting my shins on a metal bar and you very quickly, I notoriously had the worst flyaway ever because I drilled my shins a few times. And unfortunately mm -hmm. my coach loved him to death, but like we didn't go back through technical steps. Yeah. And I put double backs to my face so many times because it was just like never technically right. So can you please talk about like fears of flyaways, like developing mental blocks on that and how we prevent kids from like just doing the old scoop into shin bar? Yeah. So the, the key, the key for me, I heard this from a coach over in the UK, he came to Australia, did a presentation and uh, actually, do you know, um, uh, Ashley Watson? Again, know of, but don't yeah. know personally. Yeah. Ash Watson is, is a crazy gymnast. He has the current record for fly away from one bar to another lengthwise, right? Like he's, he's, he's insane. He's got, he's went to Cirque and stuff. You can find him on YouTube. A lot of people will know him. He's, he's nuts. Uh, and I believe it was his coach who, when he came to Australia, was talking about how they developed that. Cause he's, this guy actually does things like death on high bar, which is like a ginger with a one and a half twist. Uh, he does like Kovacs and Coleman's and he does it all over the hard. He never trains over the pit which sounds crazy, right? And I saw this, I got to go, he does triple back of high bar, like, but they build up mats and stuff and, and he does it all over the heart. He, he hates training over the pit. Um, and so he's a daredevil and his coach has a rule. You're never allowed to hit the bar. That's, that's the rule. And obviously at some point, I'm sure this guy is hitting the bar when he does certain skills, but with the young guys, they just made sure they did lots of crazy stuff. They would sit on top of a bar that build up foam underneath and the kids would flip backwards and then try to do as many back tucks as they can on the way down. Uh, so they do lots of crazy things, but, but the technique was always developed really well. So they would never hit the bar, you know? And so they end up building confidence around the apparatus and not actually fear of the apparatus. So the first thing is you, you're never allowed to let a kid hit the bar. So if you have any doubt in your mind that they're ready for it, spot it. Don't don't let them have attempts by themselves. Spot it, spot it, spot it um, until you're actually like just genuinely just dead sure until you would you would bet your house on it, you know? So that's one of the things that I think about. I basically, I tell, I tell my athletes because sometimes they'll ask if they can try it by themselves and I don't think they're ready yet and I'll say no. Um, but, you know, like I basically say to them, look, I don't gamble. You know, I'm not, I'm not a gambler and I'm not going to gamble on your health. I'm not going to gamble on your hitting the bar. Um, and I don't like, I, I'll tell them like, I know that if you start to hit that bar, I now have three years of problems or you might eventually quit the sport. So you're not hitting the bar. So, so I'm going to keep spotting you until it's perfect. So, yeah, so I really take my time. And then, all the things we talked about, about length, about making good shapes, those are basically the foundation of a flyaway. If you have a, if you have a really, like a genuinely great swing, really well technically developed and it's hitting bar height, front and back, um, and they know how to kick in the dish and they know how to keep their head still, I can often take that athlete and have them doing a flyaway, maybe even by themselves in the space of a couple of training sessions, easy. Uh, if you have bad swings, I might never let that kid do a flyaway by themselves. Like, like I might, I might never get to the point where I actually like. I you have to fix the, the way I teach it. You have to fix the swing shape first. So it can actually be like it's almost bad because it can take a really long time for me to teach someone to do a flyaway if the swings aren't well developed. But I, I think it's just the right thing to do to take that time and to do it properly. Yeah, I agree. And this goes back to the conversation of like skill development versus fear and stuff like that. Oftentimes, yeah. and I, I'm sure you have the same experience is like a lot of kids don't understand why they hit the bar in the first place, right? Like we have this conversation about like, I'm scared to do a flyway. Why are you scared? I don't want to hit the bar. Okay, why do you hit the bar? And they're like, huh, I don't actually know what caused me to hit the bar. I just hit the bar. And you break yeah. down and you teach them. I'm a big like diagrams of like bar reaction. I'm like, okay, well, engine of release and all that. Yeah, right. I'm like, yeah, if we if we like pull the bar back and have an early tap, we watch our feet and we have an open shoulder angle, you hit the bar because you either tap at the wrong time, you close your shoulders, or you hang on ridiculously long and you don't understand the yeah. skill. And if they can see the dot connecting, like, oh, if I tap in the back, the bar reaction is long this way, it's more gonna shoot me out long ways versus up ways, yeah. right? So that's a piece of it. And then like shoulder angles and closing what you're talking about, but breaking down why you hit the bar, what can we do technically to, to reverse engineer that? Or like you say, what drills do we need to work on to understand how to do those things correctly? So how can we work yeah. our tap strings? Where can we look? How can we keep our shoulder angle going long? That's how people develop the confidence to rebuild their steps. So if you start from that position of not having to go all the way back to those steps, empowering the athlete to understand, okay, I know why I hit the bar and now I can work on strategies and tools to not hit the bar with my technique. I think that's very, very important for people. And my process for actually teaching the flyaway, I, I try to keep it really simple as well. Like, it, and, and it's easy to go back a step is the guys just do swings and then they let go on the front of the swing. And their goal is to kind of like, 
like I, I tell them this, uh, is that you want to try to land on your head. <laughs> you want to try to neck yourself, yeah? And and my job is I'm going to stop your rotation and place yeah. you on your back, you know, because I don't have a pit at my new club. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, stop the rotation, place on your back. And what I'm looking for there is is how are they creating rotation? That's That's one of the key things. So they should create rotation through the kick, right, through changing from an arch to a hollow. That should be what starts to generate rotation. The toes should be lifting as they swing. And if they release at the right time while the toes are still lifting, they'll start to turn over. That's what I want to see. If they don't have a kick, if they're arching, if they're coming up and they're arching or they kick and then arch, they're not creating rotation with the tap. So where's the rotation going to come from? It'll have mm. to come from the shoulders because mm. most athletes are smart. Most athletes, they know if their body is going to rotate or not and they will compensate. If they're missing an ingredient, they'll they'll make something else up and they'll they'll make it work. So if they don't scoop to a hollow, they will end up closing their shoulders, which is why I'm so particular about what kind of swing I want because I just know like from my experience in teaching flyaways and having having some really bad experiences with athletes where they ended up quitting the sport because of flyaways. Like oh, that's why I'm passionate about it. Yeah. I don't like that. That's not good. Yeah. Um if I know that if they don't actually kick to that shape, the only way they're going to create rotation is to, to throw their head and pull on the bar. Sure. So I have to get a good swing first or I just will get a bad flyway. It's just like, <laughs> there's no, yeah. there's no second think, way about it. Is Nick Hollow swing the shoulder stands? I think is when like you stand in the spotting block, yeah. grab their armpits and pull them away. Yeah, yeah. Um, that sounds right. Yeah, candlestick. I sometimes call it swing the candle or sure. candle drop. Yeah, and I think that's those are dead cows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are fun. Um, I think, yeah, they're good, right? You can teach the mechanic of the swing. You can teach where to look. You can teach the controlling of rotation. Like, it's very, very important. Same thing about, like, the ability to control rotation on floor. Like, that's pretty scary for kids. So, yes. Um, yeah. All right. Speaking of dead cats, I think we've beat that point to death. So yes. <laughs> um, let's kind of go a little bit more macro. I kind of want to start zooming out here and talking about maybe like some like like prehab stuff first and then also some like educational stuff uh, lastly because you have a, obviously yeah. a lot of uh, – effort into your education but let's kind of go with the other two things we get a lot of uh, comments about so like prehab in general and then for men it's always like shoulders and wrists so like yeah. in the bucket of i want my shoulders to last long term and then my wrists to last long term what are you doing early from the younger age to try to be proactive against some of those things down the road which one do you want shoulders or wrists first let's go shoulders first shoulders uh so I, a lot of your stuff i look at um I'm not, I don't think I've. These aren't planning mastered. questions, by the way, everybody. I'm not like. Yeah. <laughs> well, like genuinely, I have been following Shift for like since you started, I think. So um, a lot of deals, like one of the first things that um, that I ever looked at was your your first strength um, yeah. workshop. Yeah, 2015, I remember meeting you with Nick in London or yes. Birmingham, like whatever that is, which is weird because yeah. in a month I'm going back to London for the next one, full circle. Oh, nice. That's cool. I'm jealous. Go on. I want to go. Right. I want to go. Um, but the so basic stuff, bands, of course, you know, all of your, your stuff. I think guys tend to that the biggest problem they have is external rotation. I think that's that's the the real Definitely. key that you need to work on. So raw strength stretches. Yeah. Yep. What's that? Sorry? I just say raw strength of ER is one of the most common things we see is lacking. There you go. Yeah, I've got some guys where they literally can't lift their hands off the floor, um, like, you know, laying down flat. They just can't externally rotate off. So stretching that stuff. Um, and then what I've found, I, I use bands. Um, but I find, I, I don't know, I can't I can't see if the athlete is getting stronger when they're using a band. I don't know. That's, that's just something that I have trouble, like, kind of quantifying in my head. Whereas if I see them doing a body weight movement or if I see them doing something with a, a, an actual weight, it's easier for me to see if we're making progress or not. Um, so my favorite one for external rotation is they kind of, they sit with their knee up and they put their elbow on their knee with a, with a, a weight and they, they actually make it quite heavy. I, I basically don't want them to be able to lift it by themselves. I want them to like lower down, like doing an eccentric lower into like quite an internally rotated position. And then they try to lift it and they use their other hand to get it back up. And we do about five repetitions of that. Um, and we do like maybe three or four sets of that. Uh, and I had an athlete basically who uh, was had amazing swings on rings and what was letting him down was his handstand. He had like a lot of internal rotation. It was very unstable and his press was with bent arms. So we started doing this like multiple times a session a week as well as all the work we were doing on his ring handstands. And just after the, uh, like over the course of maybe two months, his handstand on rings just became so, so, so much stronger. Uh, and he ended up winning gold at nationals on rings for, you know, for that. So it was worth it. Uh, but external rotator was the main additional thing that we added in that we weren't doing before that. So, so that's probably a big one. Um, and then just lots of like stretching, like just lots of stretching. If you do every time on rings, uh, one, a good ring swing, I think does stretch the shoulders as well. And then that's why you should be doing extra stretching outside of that. Because if the only 
kind of stretch they're going to get is this uncontrolled swinging action. I don't know how healthy that is for their shoulders. Whereas if I've put them like you, you would have seen in my presentation or, or you know, if you watched it, um, is there's, there's drills where they're basically, they're stretching down with weights um, and it mimics the backswing position on rings. And because it's weighted, they can gradually increase the, how long they hold it and how heavy it is and how low they go. And it's basically strengthening those muscles in that end range position at the same time as stretching it. So I think that then has better like preparation for shoulder health when they actually start swinging as well. So those, those would probably be the main things, a lot of shoulder stretching, uh, external rotator stuff, uh, and then just good posture and, and things in general. I'm just nitpicky about not having shoulders high all the time, but being able to get their shoulders down, retracting, you know, shoulders back, layouts and stuff on floor, really pushing back through the shoulders. So I'm getting like everywhere that I can, I try to find a way for the technique to help to also improve the body. Mm. If that kind of makes sense. So on layouts on floor, I really want to see shoulders pinching back and, and arms pressing out wide and getting really active in the back there because every layout they do then is one, I think is good for their technique, but two, I'm actually developing shoulder retraction at the same time. So yeah, two yeah, birds three stones. Very important, like kind of sub threads you said there. So one is for sure ER and posterior rotator cuff strength is notoriously underworked um, along with like middle trap, lower back, upper back. So that's very important. I completely agree with dumbbells to objectively watch somebody get uh, progress over time when we give them to people in the clinic we're trying to say a one pound jump per week or every other week so four five six seven eight nine ten and the other piece is that you actually want to make sure you're using load that's real again the most common thing we see is an error is like smaller muscles their stabilizers do three sets of 30 with a very light exercise but like force is force man ring swing force high bar force subtraction forces it's a lot on your cuff so you need raw strength to go up to tolerate those forces um, and then the eccentric overload is like a, a two for one, right? Like you're getting the eccentric cuff overload, but you're also stretching IR and you're stretching out the posterior sh uh, shoulder, which often yeah. gets extremely tight and guys from doing a lot of pulling work and stuff like that. So yeah, man, I totally agree. And then back to the point of like stretching in the long swing, like it definitely happens. And the reason we need to do more is because consistency over intensity is the key, but also oftentimes in those long compound stretches of like a full ring swing, it's all of the things being stretched. It's the ligament, it's the capsule, it's the soft tissue, which is fine. You're not going to hurt anybody. But if you're only using that as a way to stretch and you're only doing like overstretching, chances are you're probably biasing the ligament and the joint capsule yeah. more than the soft tissue. So the soft tissue needs very specific attention because it's constantly getting beat up when you're doing gymnastics and it gets stiff, but also kids grow. Arms, arm bones grow faster than muscles yeah. can keep up with. And, and that's why they get tight oftentimes. That makes a lot of sense. I'll just quickly share a, a horror story as well for ring swings. Yeah, um, I, I shared this in the symposium thing, but um, I had some uh, an athlete who was a bit of a natural at swinging on rings. Once he learned the technique and stuff, was able to turn over really well. Um, so he was at the point, he was 10 years old or nine years old, I think. And he was swinging to, you know, 45 to 60 degrees um, above horizontal, like, you know, quite, quite good swings. Um, but what I hadn't noticed, and again, this is why I like try to train my eyes to be as technical as possible. And I ask lots of questions and I, I find out things because, you know, I didn't know this when I was younger. He was turning his hand too far when he was swinging. So he was rolling his hand all the way. So the palm was backwards, which I also now know means that, you know, he wouldn't be able to put good pressure on the rings and he'd probably roll too quickly and in locates and it has a whole lot of other effects. But what I also ended up finding out is basically because he was rolling internally so much and then hanging, I don't think you can really use your chest uh, strength much to control that position when you've rolled through. I think you end up being very capsular. Uh, and this kid who's, you know, 10 years old and had you know quite healthy shoulders and was fairly well developed physically uh, ended up with a slap tear, um, which didn't quite, apparently there's a certain amount that it has to get to before it requires surgery. So it was just under what required surgery. Um, but man, I was like, that's not, you don't want to be able to, as a coach, put um, a 10 year old getting a shoulder reconstruction on your resume, <laughs> you know? So I took that very seriously afterwards. So, uh, things like the technique that actually technique can help keep an athlete safe as well. So it is important that you go out and find out what the, what the safest and best technique is. Yeah, for sure. And I can obviously jump in here and, and kind of explain why that happens a little bit more is essentially when you internally rotate your shoulder that much to end range, um, it, it definitely makes the pec less helpful because the pec is an internal rotator along with being a horizontal adductor. So when you over shorten the muscle, it's hard for it to work. You know, we're, we're most like in a fly zone here, we can push yeah. really hard. If I'm like this, I can't really push much with my chest because it's so over shortened. So yes, okay. it makes it that way. But also too, is when you internally rotate your shoulder a lot, the, the shoulder bone itself tends to sit further forward in the joint. So it's riding the front of the rim of the labrum more. 
And then also when you're in that position and you're elevated, when you IR and you elevate, it, it compresses the subacromial space more. So everybody impinges it. It's kind of a normal phenomenon, but essentially yeah. you take the ball forward and then push it up into the underside of the collarbone. You're rubbing the top of the labrum quite a bit and the joint capsule more when the biceps anchor attaches to the top of the labrum right there. So a lot of guys get slap tears because of all the things we've talked about there, uh, soft tissue is not extremely mobile and they're hyper mobile in their capsule to make up for that. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of kind of like forward and up positions all the time with those like really rounded shoulders. And it rubs the front of the labrum a little bit. Then you have extremely high biceps forces, extremely high pec forces that kind of puts more stress on the labrum. So that kind of extra instability, uh, micro instability, plus that high rubbing force over time, mm -hmm. a lot of inlocates, a lot of dislocates, a lot of P bar swings. That is just rubbing and extreme hyperextension of the shoulder behind the back also pushes the glenoid forward out. So that's yeah. another like forward glide. So yeah, there's a small dissertation on slap tears for you. But that's, you were making me feel sick with the <laughs> like visualizing that. I was like, oh god. Yeah, it's, it's grimy, you. man. It's it yeah. actually it's, it's an important thing. That's why a lot of guys get cuff issues and a lot of guys get um, slap tears and stuff because of basic flexibility premises, the cuff strength, the the it's disproportionate of how strong the cuff is versus the deltoid, the pecs, the lats. Dude, those things are huge on male gymnasts, yeah. like pecs, lats. We do so much. So think about these giant muscles pulling on these small little uh, tiny cuff muscles trying to keep up. You need to increase soft tissue flexibility, a lot of stretching, a lot of soft tissue care, a lot of eccentrics, increase raw strength of ER, dumbbells, what we're talking about here, and then have good technique. Yeah. Like you really need to have good technique and go slow and teach these things well through puberty in particular. They're not strong enough to handle some of these forces. So if you have a kid who's stiff, doesn't have cuff strength, and is going through not great technique and is trying to learn a cross when he's 12 before puberty, that yeah. equals cuff irritation. So there you go. One of these these concepts that I, I've been like thinking about more and more because I always try to look for the patterns in skills and, and I try to look at like the underlying reason why something happens. And I think as a coach, as you get better at that, you get better at like fixing the root cause of the problem and, and you just become more efficient at, at coaching. So I'm always looking at that. I'm always asking questions with good coaches about what they care about, what they're looking for. When you're on pommel, okay, you've got to imagine that the body has to stay balanced, right? Of course, as it's circling around, they, they have to stay balanced. So it's kind of like a seesaw. All right. If you bend the legs, okay, that has to affect the overall balance, right? So what you're doing is you're bringing the legs in closer. Now, if the shoulders were back far enough that when the body was straight, it was balanced. When the legs bent, now everything should be leaning a bit too far back and you should fall off, right? So athletes though will circle and they will bend their legs a lot and they're not falling off. So if you kind of think about that, that has to mean that when they're bending their legs, they're lifting their shoulders forward. They're bringing their shoulders forward. And that is not a position you want an athlete to get good at because if they were shoulders forward and legs are straight, they would be falling forward. Does that, does that kind of make sense? So as they're circling, I really, really strongly believe just as a little foundational thing that, I, that I've been trying to work on with my guys right from the beginning, just don't accept any knee bend when you're trying to teach circles. I've got like a, a method that I'm happy to go through of how I develop circles, but I just try to get completely straight body, even if it's not perfectly straight, but like very straight body right from the beginning. And, and I don't really accept much bending. Obviously if there are 20 circles and they're trying to break a record, maybe they start to lose it. Um, but in general, do not allow leg bend because the athlete will just be learning to circle in a position that's actually not real. It's not an actually balanced position when the legs go straight up. So the second the legs go straight up, they're going to struggle to circle and they'll probably fall off. So that's a little, little kind of hack that I think a lot of coaches maybe rush to just try to get numbers and they allow any sort of technique. But I think my guys ended up like it takes a little bit longer to get circles at first. But as soon as they start to get this concept, man, they just run with it. And I end up with like some, some pretty good pommel workers. We've got some good guys now coming through the club um, that are starting to pick up pommel quite, quite naturally. Yeah, I love that. And please definitely expand on kind of your 101 of how you develop circles for sure. Yeah. So the first thing is it starts on beam. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Go on. <laughs> so um, front support on a beam. So they put their hands like they, you're facing sideways to the beam. Okay. Uh, not lengthways. And the hands go on the beam and they jump up and they hold a front support. So their body, the beam's here. Uh, I'm sorry for people that are listening audibly. The right. beam is at their hips. Their hands are, are by their side and they're holding that position. So they have to lean forward a little bit to maintain that balance because the legs can't hang directly under them. 
Uh, then you do the exact same thing in a rear support and you have the hands turned backwards for this just because it's the only way it works when you do the next step. So hands are backwards. Um, their, their bottom is kind of like on the beam but not sitting. You're pushing your hips forward so the body line becomes straight. Um, head is back a little bit so you've got good posture. And for a lot of young kids, they, they actually will really struggle just to do that rear support on the beam because they have to lean back. And that's a scary thing for people. It's like when you first learn to do scuba diving and you've got to like trust fall backwards into the water. For a lot of people, it's really scary. So they have to lean back, okay? Uh, sometimes, by the way, I put a crash mat underneath them and I shove them off. <laughs> so they don't, they know, they've they been taught not to put their hands behind them. So it's Learn to safe. fall, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, but to actually get them to lean back, I will sometimes make them fall. <laughs> so they realize it's not actually that bad if they do fall. Sure. And then they'll, they'll be more comfortable. So a little hack, shove the kids. Um, so then they go, they go from uh, that rear support position and they have to lean sideways, lift a hand up and turn over to front support. Yeah. And the goal is to keep the body as straight as they can while they do that. The only way to do that successfully is to lean backwards and lean in the direction you want the circle to go. So lean basically opposite to the legs. They have to lean as they turn. And then once they get to front support, they then keep going and they try to turn to rear support. Okay. So what you're doing there is in a very static, very controlled way, you're actually teaching them how the shoulders move during a circle, but it's like kind of 2D. So instead of a 3D shoulder circle, you're doing it 2D. They still learn to lean and shift their weight and stuff, but it's much more static. It's much more stable. It's much easier. There's, there's less moving parts. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. We do a lot of work on that. Uh, and I do work on that regularly kind of until they they can do like 10 circles we we tend to we do like sometimes we'll just do a warm-up where we do a whole bunch of uh beam pommel exercises the other one would be like a rear support on the beam where both hands are actually on the beam like the girls do handstands but it's behind your back and holding a nice straight body um hips up in front that's that forces a lot of shoulder uh retraction uh it's about as narrow as the hands are ever going to get um if you get good at that and you're strong at that you know you're not going to have any problem with putting your hands on a handle one handle circles behind your back so that's that's a really good one i saw that over in the uk for the first time uh also crab walking on a beam do you guys do crab walks yeah, so, so bent legs, yeah. yeah. So in that rear sport position and walking across the beam with absolutely straight arms every time they take a step. Uh, and that, again, teaches a little bit of shoulder control, balance, strength behind their back. It's it's like a really good bend for your buck. You get, you get amazingly strong doing that one. So that's the conditioning side of things that the guys have started from, a, from an early age. On the actual mushroom, what we do is I try to use what they've just practiced. They've just practiced leaning and holding their like hips on, on the mushroom and feet off the ground, right? So we do that on a mush, uh, sorry, on the beam, that's what they just practiced. On the mushroom, we do the same thing. So front support with their feet off the ground, rear support with their feet off the ground, and then side support and side support. And when they do the side support, the other hand comes on in front. So so it's like, like if they stopped at three quarters of a circle. So they learn those positions. Then what they learn to do is to swing to the halfway, or you can do three quarters, but I tend to skip that one. Um, so you can do a quarter position, side support, but I skip it, but they, they step, they swing to rear support. And instead of letting their feet touch the floor, their goal is to catch with their body straight, leaning mm. back enough that the feet hover off the ground. Yep. Because again, what you're doing there is they, they have to have their shoulders far enough back to, to stop the legs from falling. Sure. That is what they will do in a circle. It's just done at a kind of slower, slower sort of pace. So once they can do rear support like that, we go on to trying to get three quarters of a circle where the hand, the second hand comes in front and they have to capture that three quarter position. And again, feet are off the floor every time. Uh, full circle, feet off the floor. So they're leaning forward in a front support and then eventually one and a half. And once they can do one and a half there, they're usually right to then start doing just numbers and, mm. and numbers. Uh, and they can make some kids take a long time to get the three quarter point because um, they just don't. A lot of the main mistake young kids will do is they just don't lean onto the opposite arm enough. They, they lean to one side too much and they keep falling that direction. Yeah. So the other little tip that I'll give with that is as they're doing all of this, like obviously they're going to stuff up. Right. So they try to go for a half circle and they lean too far forward and their feet touch the ground. Yeah. My athletes, I, I try to be really strict on this because I think you, you make so much faster progress if you do it. They have to lean back then, get their feet off the ground, get to the correct position that they should have been in, and mm -hmm. they have to hold it for three seconds, and mm -hmm. then they can reattempt. So if they fall then, even if they're trying to do full circles, but they fall at three quarters, they don't go and hold the full circle then. They, they hold where they fell. They hold right. at that three-quarter position yeah. because I want the last thing that they they thought of just before their next attempt is where they needed yeah. to be. Teaching that and then they try it again and they try to go through that position and often you see really quick progress with that. The ones that don't make progress in my group, or at least 
progress that's as quick as some of the others are the ones that don't follow that like well enough you know the ones right. that if i'm not watching they'll just they'll just have turns and they don't really yeah. it. they're the ones that don't make progress yeah so yeah so that's that's how i teach pommel. and all of that is done with straight legs and good body shapes and yeah. you know if you very quickly you can do like little lower level routines and stuff without many deductions if you train it that way i've, I've found yeah i absolutely love that man i think it's a really cool process to take it on beam first and then kind of teach them how to lean, teach them where to fall. And I think we're kind of answering our own question a little bit here, but so on this of like how much pommel work we're doing and drill work is like, how do you definitely help the younger ones without like growth plate and wrist injuries and like, you know, getting overworked wrists, you know, the solution oftentimes is just like toss them like, you know, wrist supports on and tape it up and keep going. But right. one of this is definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you do a lot of physical preparation, not on the mushroom, not on the actual event mm -hmm. to try to build them up more with like beam walks and crosswalks and stuff like that yeah. seems like one, but what else are other, a uh, few like little nuggets that you're doing to try to stay ahead of wrist issues? Obviously they come up, but yeah so one thing that is that i also want them shaping for pommel circles in ways that don't load the wrist i know that that's like we're, we're talking about loading the wrist and stuff like that but i'll do things like rear supports on their elbows or side supports on their elbows so i can still shape the body and get them strong at retraction and shoulder extension all that kind of stuff um but it's without loading the wrist so that's that's one thing is i try to be smart about still getting shaping work done but without necessarily like like adding extra load. If we're going to do a heavy pommel session, I might want some really good technical work through their body, but I don't want to have their wrist get extra sore. So that's one thing. Um, load management is obviously the the key to this. Uh, when I've asked you about wrist, I, or this was your feedback. <laughs> and so I've gone with that is um, basically just gradually increasing how much you're doing. Don't, don't have any massive spikes. Don't have a couple of weeks where you, where you peter off and do nothing basically. Yeah. So don't, uh, don't go have big peaks and troughs. Try to very steadily increase your, your training load over time is one of the, one of the main things. Um, the beam stuff is again, quite good. If you can do like we do a bunch of different things. I've got a video on Instagram. So a lot of, a lot of the, the things I'm talking about and, and stuff that I'm doing, I try to put them together in little clips. So if you guys are interested, you can have a look at my Instagram. If you scroll down enough, you'll find a pommel exercise uh, video where it's just a whole lot of pommel exercises done on the beams. So beams can finally be useful. You know, <laughs> there's finally a reason for them being in the gym. <laughs> uh, um, and then wrist push-ups is, is something that I do. So again, there's, there's a video on that. But there's a whole secret sequence of push-ups for the wrist that I, I took from Japan. Uh, and those I found to be like very useful for the guys. So we often do it as a warm-up when they get to pommel now. Um, and I teach my younger group so they can eventually start doing it independently. Um, a lot of my guys will get to pommel and maybe I haven't told them to do the wrist push-up exercises, but they might be feeling a bit stiff that day. So they go through their sets and stuff. And it's just, if you do it well, it's enough that you really start to feel a burn. Uh, and you know, a lot of blood is going to that area and you're getting a lot of movement. And I just think it's, it's a good way to prepare for a nice heavy pommel session. And also I'm getting that, you know, bang for the buck and it's strengthening over time. And then the last thing that I would say is I did a bit of research. It was a bad scientific study that didn't work very well. Uh, while I was at university, I had to do some sort of uh, scientific study for, for one of my um, courses. And, uh, and I looked at, I compared grip strength. I, I had a look at grip strength. Uh, wrist flex active wrist flexibility, I think it was with like one of those gyroscope things. And then um, reporting of wrist pain with my athletes, as well as like maybe maximum number of circles or something that they could do. And what I ended up finding with that data, which was not a big enough sample size to, to actually say anything about, is that um, the guys that had really great grip strength actually had more wrist pain because and i think because of the lack of flexibility in the wrist so there was a few that had good grip strength and good flexibility that didn't report as much um, wrist pain but i think if you do a lot of gripping and a lot of chin-ups and a lot of rope climbs and you don't then work on this stretch this ability to stretch back the opposite way and maybe even some strength in the back of the hand to like extend i think then you're, you're much more likely to get wrist pain because you're just you're just so stiff you're really fighting against everything i don't know the technical you might be able to share why that's yeah. happening but yeah no for sure i'll help. give you i'll give a, a quick little dork you know interest yeah, so, <laughs> yeah there's there's two two bones in your wrist you have the radius and the ulna so the radius is on the outside here and the ulna is on the inside here radius is thumb side for those aren't listening or those who aren't watching and then ulna is pinky side so when you weight bear on your wrist like uh, 80 to 90 something percent goes through the radial side which is what we've we've seen in research studies and so a good proportion of the radius um is pushing on the scaphoid here but the radius is longer and extends farther out like at an angle this way towards the thumb side so most of the pressure goes through the radial side and it's kind of built for weight bearing a little bit more not as much as your ankle obviously but the radius presses on the scaphoid and so you have a lot of guys who will develop some soreness back there and it will get better but what happens over time unfortunately sometimes is if your wrists are extremely stiff 
and you can't get fully into this risk extended position and you do too much too soon and you're not monitoring your workload, what happens is that this growth plate starts to prematurely close. So this radius now starts to close. The ulna keeps growing and it essentially starts to shift to a flat angle this way. So it's no longer angled towards the thumb side. If you're watching, it's now flat. And what happens is the ulnar side, which is not uh, built for weight bearing, starts to get pressure on the TFCC and some of the, uh, the carpal bones over here. So it's called ulnar variance. So normally you have a positive ulnar variance where the uh, the sorry the negative ulnar variance where the radius is longer than the ulna. If you get a zero, it becomes a zero ulnar radiance where now you have the ulna and the radius are matching and that's not good because the weight is starting to go on the other side. The really not so gnarly thing is the positive ulnar variance, which is the opposite. So now the radius is shorter than the ulna. And so it goes this way and you have a ton of pressure on the TFC ligament in the back of the wrist here. So a lot of guys will get complaints of the growth plate on the radial side is just like backing off, going slow, getting your wrist flexibility, doing yeah. strength, not doing too much pommel work. But then if it gets, if you just keep blowing through pain, it keeps going and going, which is why it's so important to talk about. You can get a bony shift and, the, and a lot of guys have to get surgery where they actually put a screw in the ulna side to arrest it to not grow faster to get the radius to catch up. So Damn. there you go. There's a the dissertation on ulnar variance. And, and the, the way I've found the, to help with the flexibility, obviously you can do lots of things, just like general stretching and all that kind of stuff. Um, but one of my favorite ones, because again, I, I try to find things where I'm getting a whole lot in one one thing, you bang for your buck, you know? Um, a rear support position with the palms actually touching behind their back mm, on flat yeah. ground. Yeah. Because it puts, if they lift up nice and high, it actually puts them in a really extent. So some guys won't be able to do that straight away and they might start a little bit wider, um, but it brings their hand really close together, kind of like on the beam, but yeah. it actually is a, a really like quite an aggressive aggressive um, wrist stretch as well. So yeah. I get strength, I get shoulder retraction, I get all that kind of stuff. I get pommel yep. work. It's good for one handle stuff, um, but it's also going to stretch their wrists. So that's a really good one too. Yeah. And, just and then, on. go yeah. ahead, sorry. No, you go. I was gonna say just digging a lacrosse ball in your forearms, like in the the meat yeah. of your forearms, like all the way down to here. Like like you're saying, so much grip work happens on guys' mm -hmm. gymnastics. They're just getting a lacrosse ball to dig in all of the meat here. A lot of guys will get like ulnar, like like shin splints almost, but for their yeah. forearm. So just going really hard with lacrosse ball, like getting a good stretch session in, like doing a, like if you can get manual therapy from someone too, that's cool. But you don't need to. Um, but yeah, I agree. A lot of this is good. You can also just kneel on it as well, rather than a lacrosse ball. I, I teach the athletes to put their arm on the ground and just kind of knead it with their knee. Um, and that, that tends to help while, while moving their knee. hand and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the, the last thing I'll say for, for like uh, wrist health and stuff and, and managing that is um, check the technique of what they're doing on pommel, because what often happens is there's, there's two kind of things that can cause problems. One, they lean too much often on the first uh, support hand. So if yep. they circle, clock counterclockwise it'll be the left hand right right yep so they'll, they'll often lean too much on that so and then and then they put their hand down late because their body basically won't turn early enough a lot of the time um i would call it counter turn is like a really key technical concept for me on pommel talk to the guys about it all the time but they don't turn early enough so what, it, what ends up happening is they overload their their left side and then when they finally do put their right hand on often what happens is they've they've lost that moment where they could put their hand down and then shift their weight onto it instead they're falling now towards it and so they hit their hand on but they hit it very hard so it's an impact and not like a transition of weight kind of mm -hmm. like you know a handspring on the floor where someone doesn't like bend it they don't like seesaw enough so their hands they jump onto their hands yep. it's that sort of idea right yeah so if you can get the athlete to turn and reach backwards and get their hand down earlier, then shift the weight, I think you get a lot less impact and you get a more of an even balance of, um, of support weight on the hands. And you'll actually hear it. Like, so if an athlete is doing the, the bad one where they put their hand down too late, you end up with a, a circle rhythm that's like, dun, dun. Oh, sorry, no, that would be good. It's like, dun. yeah. So it's like a limp. I talk to the guys about it. Like, you know, they, they tend to get it if you say, like, if I then demonstrate someone limping across the floor, they're essentially limping. And that can be really bad for, like, you know, the health of the other leg. You know, like yeah. over time, if people limp too much, I'm sure you know this, like, you know, it causes this flow and effect of like weird hips go out into different yeah. positions and all that kind of stuff. So that's one thing. And then also learning to use their fingers. So they come down fingers first and then go onto their hand and they use their fingers kind of like shock absorbers, mm. right? Uh, same way landings on floor, right? You want to start with a bit of ankle extension and then yep. you lower down and then you bend in the knees and everything helps the shock absorb. You shouldn't bend your elbow on pommel horse. You've, you've got to be pretty strong in the shoulder. So really all we've got is our, is our fingers and our wrists. So using the fingers a little bit, I think you then also get a stronger pommel over time because the fingers like push harder and faster. Right. Um, but also then it starts to work better. And what you do is you, you tell the athletes, okay, I want you to circle same speed, same stretch, but quieter. 
I just want to see how quiet can you circle? And if they can keep up some good speed and they, they get quieter, what they're actually doing is controlling the impact a little bit better and probably getting less of a jarring mm. effect on the radio. And you're not going to get that weird on the thing. We tell people with landings, like the cool landing quieter actually helps quite a bit too to reduce forces yes. on, on impact too. So yeah, this is great. And then the last thing I'll add in from the medical side is um, I think, again, just like we underload the posterior cuff, we sometimes underload just the raw wrist muscles, right? So like get a hammer, wrap an ankle weight around it and do supination only up and down, all yep. that kind of stuff. Radio, like there's tons of just basic two times a week grunt work you can do just like the shoulder to try to get the wrist and the, the elbow stronger. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sweet, man. All right. So we're already pretty long here because this conversation has been awesome, but yeah. let's, let's zoom out a little bit. Cause like, clearly you have done a lot of education. You have studied, you know, myself and Nick and others. I know you travel abroad a ton. I would love to just kind of end this conversation on one, why you value education and you obviously invest so much into it. And then two, the actual strategic of like, how do you kind of get in the gym and learn from these like pretty high level coaches? Okay. So first, first, the why is, is it's a responsibility thing for me. Um, if I, I've got athletes that I, like I said, I go out and I tell an ID, you know, I look at all the boys that we've got in the club and I look for the guys that I think have amazing potential and I'd love to have an Olympian one day. So I'm looking for the guys that are extremely talented. Now let's say I get those athletes and I'm working with them and I don't know what I'm doing. And then after, or, or maybe I do know what I'm doing, but I don't, uh, I'm missing some stuff, right? Over time, those athletes will never reach the maximum potential that they could have. And that's just such a depressing thought for me. <laughs> like if they, if I work with an athlete, eventually some of these guys I'm coaching at, at eight years old, I'm hopefully going to be coaching them 12 years later. Like I want to coach them when they're 20, because that's when I'll, I'll get the, the fruits of my labor of like some Olympic success or world championship success if I did a good job. Um, if I'm with them for 10 years, 12 years, and they never reach that potential, and I end up thinking over time, hey, that's because I did really bad things with them when they were younger. It just, I, you know, I caused injuries. I had bad technique. You know, I, I let them do bad flyaways, and now they're scared of high bar, and they won't do it, and I don't have an all-around athlete anymore. Um, all of those things, like it kind of freaks me out to think that I could spend 10, 12 years with an athlete and then end up realizing that I just, if I had just learned a little bit more, that athlete would have reached their maximum potential. So that's the first thing for me is, is I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste my chance with the athletes, um, to, to, you know, do something cool in this sport. You know, I really want to have an athlete that just looks as amazing as Kohei, you know, like I want to do some beautiful gymnastics, you know, that's, that's part of it. So that's probably the first thing. That's probably the motivator. I don't know if you want to touch on anything there. Oh, I, I like, I like that. There's two pieces. One is I like the accountability. I like that. Like, this is, this is not the, the athlete is doing all the work and I'm just like riding the coattails. Like you're very much, a, I always view it as a, as a pair partnership towards a common goal. That is what yeah. I believe coaching gymnastics is. I think you are like, you would like to get this athlete to an endpoint, and they also would like to reach that endpoint. And you guys are working together, whether they're seven, whether they're 17, whether they're 27, you're working together towards a common goal. And you both share responsibility and accountability. The athlete has to take care of themselves and work hard and listen and be disciplined and show up. Yeah. But as coaches, we have to uh, constantly be studying and evolving our techniques and finding what's new, what's not new, changing our approach, not just being so dogmatic in one. And like, yeah, it's a shared accountability that we're both we're both putting an effort to keep making this get better and better and better. And, and that's, that's what I detect. And I really appreciate you for that. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And then the other, the other thing that motivates me with alongside that is that I know right now that I'm making a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Like, like, like I'm positive that even though I'm trying to educate as much as I can, I'm, I'm always trying to think about better ways to do things and all that kind of stuff. I'm just like positive that there's a whole lot of things right now that I'm still doing very wrong. And that in five, 10 years, I'll be kicking myself that I was doing it wrong. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm just, I'm just sure every like, you know, technology changes, um, you know, the way people train, it's like sports is this constantly evolving field. And especially gymnastics is insanely quick how, how much people are progressing and, and trying new things. So I know that there's going to be things that I'm doing wrong. I can wait until five, 10 years later, it becomes obvious that I did them wrong. And I can start to, because I can see the problem, you know, oh, mm -hmm. none of my kids can do this skill because I missed this part of preparation five years ago. You know, like I, like I didn't address like vision on a trampoline, say, so they got bad aerial awareness. So when they're on the apparatus later on, I can't do anything advanced, you know? Yeah. It'll be obvious at some point that I got it wrong. I'm hoping that by educating myself, I can see before I get that problem, I can start to see, hey, maybe this was wrong. Like, you know, another coach can tell me, I did that five years ago. Don't do it. <laughs> That's yeah. done. Do this instead. Um, you know, I, it, I can basically tap into people that are smarter and better at coaching than me. They've been around longer. They've produced some good results. And I can find the mistakes that I might be making right now and I can correct them earlier, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's that's, that's a big thing. Humility, and I don't right? want to wait for that. I that's on humility, that right? There's one layer of yeah. humility, which is something happens, you make a mistake, and you're like, "Oh man, my fault. Sorry. You know, I'll be better about this in the future." All this. There's there's a more advanced layer of humility, which is in the moment. I already know I'm I'm not all where I need to be, or there's something's going to change. Yeah. So like proactive ability to learn that's like an extreme amount of humility and again that's this this mixture of humility and accountability together is extremely powerful for a lot of coaches and athletes that seem to have a long tail in the sport or any sport in general it's not it's not an accident how they get there right you just don't like wake up and like well you know i know i know everything about high bar now Ta-da. you know i just yeah, download it from the app so it's not how it works so yeah, yeah i like it so on that point then is like okay you have the desire the will you you know it's important like a lot of people are having trouble finding the opportunity to work with like a, a very high level coach or, or learn from them or kind of get to the gym. Like how do you do it logistically? And I guess financially as well to, to yeah. invest if your club maybe is not the one who's banking it all. Yeah. So I'll probably talk about how to, how to get that started the relationship first. So one, one thing that I, I like, this is, I don't want to sound psychopathic with some of this stuff, but, but I have been, I go to their house what? and I hide in their house. <laughs> no, no, it's just, I'm very, I'm, I'm quite strategic about it. And, um, yeah. and, and a lot of it's on purpose and, uh, and, you know, I'm happy to explain that. So, um, first of all, I, I think there's, there's lots of books that I read. So I've read a lot of books around, um, you know, like, like leadership and all this kind of stuff. And one of these concepts that I heard quite early on was that if you get someone to help you with something, someone does a favor for you, they actually are more likely to want to help you in the future. Sure. If you do something for them, there's they actually, even though that sounds like you've just helped them out, there's actually very little effect of they, they don't want to reciprocate. There's actually not much. But my theory is that when you've then helped someone, right, you, you remember that interaction probably and you feel a little bit invested in that person. So when that person starts to do well, Definitely. you feel part of that success, okay? And so you then wanna see them do even better. So maybe you'll help them out. So a good example of this is us having a conversation on the podcast right now. Yeah. I have not produced any good athletes, like like a really, really high level athletes at all, right? And part of the reason why we have a good relationship and stuff is because initially I'm coming to you with lots of questions and I'm asking for your opinion and you're helping me out. And then when I had the opportunity to, I'm able to give back to you a little bit as well. So, so it should be a give and take relationship. Mm. Uh, and then over time, you know, I think you, you've like, you want to see me succeed. And so, you know, you're, you will you go to bat for me. You invited me to do the shift um, symposium. And then one of the big things there is if someone then does something for you and gives you an opportunity, like if I was to go overseas or do the shift thing, you've then got to do your best to absolutely over deliver on that. Um, so like, you know, for instance, if I did a really bad job at the shift symposium, I don't think I would then be on the podcast, <laughs> Is, right? So you get this flow and effect where, you know, you've been helped by someone, they start to like you, you create a bit of a relationship, uh, in the future, maybe you get an opportunity for them or you get a chance to help them out and then you over deliver. So they like you even more. And, and then when you ask them, Hey, do you, would you mind? Like, you know, uh, I don't know all of the people that, uh, Dave Durante is really, really cool. Um, yeah. I want to go over and I want to learn how to physical condition with Dave Durante. Can you introduce me? You'd yeah. be, you, um, by the way, am I saying his name wrong? Dave no, Durante. you're good. You're good. <laughs> You'd, um, you would, you know, I'm sure be willing to help make that introduction. So okay. I think, the, the first thing, social media is so powerful. Um, just start using that to, to get in touch with people that you want to learn more of and spend more time with. Um, that, that would be the, the number one thing. So just, you know, Nick Ruddock, for instance, started his, um, what's it called? He started the first time I actually saw him do anything online was that uh, an email chain that he did yep. like on the 20 minds, like lessons of yep. a high performance coach. Um, and I listened to that. I just realized that my laptop might die and they're not too distant. I might have to pause for a sec, but, um, I, I listened to, I I was watching that and then I was interacting, replying back to his emails and, and, you know, just answering, just interacting me like, yo, this is really helpful. Oh, what do you think about this? And that kind of stuff. And just got a little bit of a dialogue back and forth. And then at one point I was able to go over to, um, to Japan and I was able to reach out to Nick and ask if he knew any contacts in Japan. And so he helped hook me up with a contact there. And again, that had this flow and effect of now, you know, Nick, Nick has then helped me with that experience. I kind of told him a little bit about what I did when I got back and stuff. So he's like, Oh, it's amazing. That was such a good experience for you. And so he's, he's also feeling good because he's helped someone out. Like, you know, they say he feels good. And then in the future, I've had opportunities to go and then spend more time with Nick and and go do things. So I think um, that's probably the, the thing that maybe people are missing is just, interacting with people and asking questions and just getting that started in a small way and gradually building it. Yeah. And and to that point, to kind of give you some roses here is like, for me personally, it's like, 
I don't know. I'm always more and I'm always starting with like, is this person a good person? Like, are they a good human? Like, do they generally have what seems like a sound moral compass? You could be, I don't know, stealing things in the back and I don't know about it, but like, do you generally have good morals and good ethics? And, and just, do you want to work hard and try to be nice? Like, it's really basic for me in terms of like who I try to interact with, who I get in the podcast. Like for sure, there's times when I want to have on someone because they're extremely knowledgeable and I want to soak up as much value, but like, 95% of the people that I work with from a brand point of view or kept in the podcast is because I believe morally and ethically, they are working hard. They're trying to make the sport better. They're trying to give back value to people in the same way that somebody helped them out along the way. And then beyond that is like, okay, like, are there certain things, you know, like expertise wise, like, could we have a lot of people on the podcast to talk about swing, swing basics? Probably. Yeah. But I'd rather talk to somebody who I vibe with because they're a good person. And then on top of that, they're not, they're not trying to like, um, like shadow dealer. There's not something they want from like in return. They're not going to be like, Oh, like they're not going to leverage the podcast and be like, try Wait, to make it money off it. You know what I mean? So like, that, yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's kind of like where I go for is like that. That's really the reason I think we vibed is because the first thing we went to in, um, and when I met you with London, uh, or Birmingham or whatever it is, it was like, he, this guy flew overseas. He's working hard. He's a nice dude. He tr clearly cares about the sports and he cares about the kids. Why would I not want to help this person? Like, why would I not yeah. want to try to give everything I possibly can to do it beyond there? There's some like, obviously like the back end monetary stuff works its way out with brand deals and stuff. But like, dude, I've had a lot of like questionable emails in my inbox about people who are trying to literally leverage the audience of the, the podcast for straight up monetary gain. They're just like, yeah. you should have me on because I'm this very smart person in gymnastics. And like, I'm also launching this product and I'm like, bro, get that shit out of here. Like, I, I don't even entertain yeah. them. Like I, I, yeah. I listen, I listen to and respond to every single DM and comment myself, usually an email, except those I'm like, not even going to yeah. give them time of day. So yeah, it's more about you as a human and you desire to want to learn and help the kids than it is about like something technical. So cheers yeah. to you. And, and then the next step to that. So you, you're creating these relationships and, and you're trying to do things is the next step is then to have like, I, I think too many people uh, set their sights too low. Um, too many people, like, like I basically, I was, I was. I've been watching the UEG, you know, European Union of Gymnastics. I've been watching those videos that they put up on men's gymnastics. I don't know if they do women's gymnastics as well, but they film them and they put them up. And I've been watching them for like eight years. Like, like I've been, it's one of the, one of the key things that's probably developed a lot of my gymnastics coaching. And, um, and then at some point like this year, I just heard that they were going to run another one. They hadn't run it for a few years. And I heard that they were running another one. And I just thought in my head, could I go to that? <laughs> you know, do you, reckon, do you reckon they'd let me go to that? I was like, no, no, they wouldn't let me go to that. But but then the, it kind of like stuck in my head a little bit and I'm finding like a day later, like I'm having a break. It's Easter. Uh, we got a four day weekend and I'm having a break and then I have to I have to get online and start doing a yeah. bit of research. So yeah. I've sent a message to Nick and saying, hey, Nick, do you know how I could get into this? And he's like, sorry, but I can't help you. I don't know anyone there. Maybe talk to Andre Popov. You know, I've got, I know Andre Popov I, when I was in the UK. I was able to spend a bit of time with him. He's one of the national coaches over there. So I've messaged Andre Popov and he's like willing to help. He's like, yeah, you know, I can help you. I remember you, you know, you're good, good bloke. Um, but then he's he's then not, not not sure who to contact. He says, you'll need to contact someone in the UEG, uh, but he's not quite sure who to contact and and like leave it with him and, and he'll have a look. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, I left it with him and I'm twiddling my thumbs, tap, 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 tap. tap. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? No, no, I've got I've to gotta keep looking. So I've Googled, um who's on the ueg men's technical committee all right so i've got the list of people i've got the president's name and stuff there's no emails i've looked for contact details there's no emails anywhere right so then i've i've put all of their names into google slowly and i've ended up i actually found the the ultimate contact that i used i i found it while searching someone else's name and what came up was a competition I just, I'm explaining this so people understand the lengths I sometimes go yeah. to, <laughs> but um, there was a competition manual uh, for like some European competition. And there was a little line somewhere that said, um, if you have any questions about apparatus specifications, contact, and then Thomas Thingvold, who's the yeah. president of the UEG technical committee, and it has his email. And so I haven't just directly emailed that then. I'm like, okay, okay, I've got that now. I've got that contact. That's the perfect person to, to email. Because I figured if I just contacted um, the UEG directly through their general person, yeah, they're going to hear an Australian wants to go to a European camp. No. like, And it, all, all it takes is that someone who doesn't have the authority to say yes anyway to just stonewall me and say, no, that's that's not something you can do. And, and it's kind of dead in the water. It's then harder to, to get it going. So I wanted to get... I wanted to get in contact with a person who could say yes, basically. So then what I've done is I've, I've then gone back to Andre. Andre, do you mind if I just directly email uh, Thomas Thingbold? I've got this contact detail um, and can I CC you into it and you could be my reference? And he said, yeah, sure. Happy to do that. So that's what I've ended up doing. 
So I've got Andre backing me up. I've emailed Thomas Thingvold. Turns out Thomas Thingvold knows someone in Australia I know quite well who's our national uh, judging coordinator. So he's ended up contacting our judging coordinator and checking if I'm a good person and stuff. And he's given me the, the all clear and, and a good reference. Uh, and that's had then this flow and effect. I've had to wait for the FIG. Right. And it took two, it took two months, basically. I, I asked in April and I didn't get official confirmation that I was going to go until two weeks before I would have to fly out. So the prices for flights had doubled by that point. So it was much more expensive for me. Um, but it took two weeks. I literally give it up on it at that point. I just thought it wasn't going to happen because it was just taking so long. But the result now is there's never been an Australian that was allowed to go to this camp. And uh, the person I know, the judging coordinator, actually asked a little while ago and got rejected because of some politics in the FIG at the time. So they've said yes to me, but they've also said yes in a way that now opens this up. So there's a pathway for future Oceania region, like New, South, New Zealand and Australian coaches to potentially go to this as well. Mm -hmm. There's like a, there's actual steps now that are in place and there's a precedent. So by doing all that extra work and having that little dream, hopefully now like we'll get two coaches to get to go to that every single year. And it was one of the best, it was the best development that I've done. Um, so it's such a, such a cool opportunity. Yeah. That's amazing, man. Again, there's like two big highlights here. One is like, being a good human. Like I, I'm a firm believer in that the, what people think about you is much more about like what you do behind the scenes when no one is looking and like your moral ethics and standards really show when you're by yourself and the lights aren't on and you're doing your own thing. So if you're just consistently being a good person, things will work out better for you down the road. Like people will know like, yeah. Oh yeah, I met him at this thing and he was nice. And like, we should like grab a drink at the bar and like, yeah, he was cool dude. Talk to him real fast. Like that's like, yeah. I'd rather people know that I'm a good person and not like what's in my brain. You know what I mean? Cause that yeah. will help me down the road to just like live a better, more full life. But because you're a good human, you have the opportunity to do that. And it's just hustle, man. It's straight hustle. Yeah. Like at the end of the day, yeah. I don't mean to be mean, but like you want to know you don't like that. That's yeah. like for, for coaching education. If you want to be a better coach, find the things you need to do, go to the people you need to do, invest the money. Don't spend all the money on like hobbies are fun, but like, there's a lot of stuff you could probably trim the fat on your lifestyle and get four or five, yeah. 600 bucks to watch a course or to go to this. So like, I used to be very much like trying to force people and give them reasons to do it. But now I'm like, yo, you want it? You don't. Like, if you want to invest the money, yeah. I'm here. I'll give you everything you possibly need. A lot of stuff I give away for free just because like, all right, you, you care you, and you want to do the right thing. Yeah. But then like, if you don't value it, then like, don't complain with the results you don't get for the work you didn't put in. That's exactly, exactly the same, same, <laughs> yeah. same thing we tell the kids. It's like, okay, if you have this goal, if you don't show up to practice, you don't put the work in and you don't care about it, then don't complain when you don't get the results. It's no different in coaching education. Like if you don't know the drills, then like, okay, figure it out. <laughs> like there's, there's people to help you here. So yeah, yeah, half of it is just good human and half of it is work your face off, man. Like be, yeah. be invested. Hustle. Yeah, hustle for yeah. sure. Cool, That's man. probably a good, good note to finish it on. I know. Yeah. Hustle. Be, be a good That's human perfect. and hustle. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Put the podcast off and go take the first step to something you definitely want to do and you've been putting off, but now you're inspired. So go do something. <laughs> nice. Um, Love that. That, man. I appreciate it. Definitely where can people find uh, what's your Instagram? What's all your social media so we can follow up on the drills and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. And at some point, I'll probably put out some YouTube stuff, um, yeah. but I haven't, haven't done much with it yet. Uh, it's at Coach Redders. So my last it. name is Redfern, so R-E-D-D-E-R-S. -E um, and yeah, I, I've, I tried it basically. I, I actually really like it because when I put together and stitch together a video, I have to go through the mental process of thinking about each of the steps and the best way to develop it. So I actually do it for my own thought process and it's, it really helps solidify my learning. Uh, but I think there's a lot of stuff, especially from this UEG camp, that is just phenomenal stuff that I got to see other people do and they've been kind enough to let me share it. So for instance, right now I have an amazing video on Kazumatsu. It's like, I, I'm actually really proud of it. It's one minute and it's like 50 drills. <laughs> it's really intense and fast paced, but it's like step-by-step step of like everything you need to learn to teach a Kazumatsu. So I definitely go, go check it, at least check out that one. <laughs> is, that, is that right down there in the bottom? That is correct. Nice. Nice. I just I just remembered that I had the function to put things up. So good for me. Right, cool. Um, cool. Nice. <laughs> uh, well, Pat, my friend, this was a jam packed episode, and I learned a lot uh, just listening to you. And I'm sure there's a lot of uh, very very grateful soon to be mag coaches out there who are grateful that you came on and shared. So appreciate your time, man. Thank you, and I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, very, no very problem. Honored. I feel honored. Yeah, no, not at all. You're you're in good company. 